Hi, everyone. Well, today I have a some time off before I have to go back to Thailand. So I'm actually here with, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, my name is Sandy Sang Duan. I'm a nurse practitioner in Georgia, but live in Alabama. Well, today she's supposed to be my student, um, and she volunteered to come over and um, having some teaching session with me. But I think I think we just go easy on each other, and we can actually ask um, many questions. So, you know, how do you end up in the United States? I, I know that becoming a nurse practitioner in the United States is not something easy for Thai people who graduate from Thailand. Can you tell me a little bit more about your background? I I actually start agriculture plant pathology in Chiang Mai University, but I almost feel it. I hate it so much. I made a bad grade. I mean, bad grade. So then I met American, and so I moved to United States with him. Okay. And then I go back to school to study two year nursing, and after that I go four year, and then after that I go for a nurse practitioner. This is quite a very long journey that you have to take. And what made you choose this field of nursing? I, my mom, when I, my mom, when I decide to go to uh, study agriculture, because I'm so dumb, I was so dumb, 18, you know. Well, she on my university, I, I, and I, say, did, I did know the difference. And I, was like, I, I was a, so dumb. It's not like you. You're this? smart. You have things set up. <laughs> I was so dumb. Well, I think you just have to have to find yourself. It's, it's not that people are dumb. They just don't know what they want to do with their life, right? Yeah. If, they, if they know exactly what they want to do, they get smarter every day because they are going to put all their effort in learning and try to get better. And I think you found yourself in nursing. Yes, I found I found my call. Since I become a nurse, I'm happy every day. That's very good. I feel happy every day. I'm like, oh, happy. Now I know, like, uh, for, for Thai people, um, I, I'm not sure if you understand what's the difference between nurse and nurse practitioner. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Nurse practitioner is almost like a doctor, but you it depends on the state where you live, where you practice. You practice like a doctor, but you're not a doctor. You can prescribe mes medication. You can do IND, laceration, do some simple procedure. You can do that. Yeah, so typically we we work with something called affiliated provider or advanced affiliated providers, which consists of nurse practitioner and a PA, which is physician assistant. They're from different background, like for the PAs, physician assistant, you can actually graduate from um, regular high school and then go into uh, PA school directly. And then after you graduate PA school, which is about three to four years, and after that, you can choose your subspecialties which what you want to do with your life like for instance you can do lung transplant you can be a, a pa in surgery pa is in urgent care something like that so np you have to go through nursing school first and therefore you become a nurse to begin with and you decide to move on to be a little bit more independent so therefore you have to do an, uh, another two years of uh, two years NPs, right? consider a master degree in nursing yeah, it's kind of a master degree. So for for medical field, it's considered like residency. So we do medical school for six years, and then residency for three to four years, and then we do fellowship and then sub fellowship, something like that. We are off different pathway, but it's all come down to the same thing, uh, and that's that's very good. So, what field are you currently working? I work in urgent care. But I can go work in primary care or specialty is the pen if they, I can get a job. But I work in urgent care. And you're currently in, in Atlanta, right? In, I work in Rome, Georgia, close to Atlanta. But the company that I work for is the base in Atlanta. Yeah. So exactly. I'm, uh, I did my fellowship back in Atlanta at Emory Hospital. Yes. So I'm very familiar with Rome <laughs> and that area. Uh, I've been there maybe once or twice, but it's not that often. It's uh, not a I, big city. Uh, it's pretty good. It's, it's, pretty good size, it's considered yeah. pretty good and uh, close to Atlanta anyway. You can just drive down there and the airport's quite busy over there, right? Yes, yeah. the airport is busy, very, very busy. Uh, you mentioned to me earlier that you're from Alabama and then you move over no, to Rome I, or? I still live in Alabama. I just drive to work in You Rome. drive to work. Is Alabama the first day that you arrived from yes. Thailand? Yes, sir. Okay. And I went to school at uh, Community College first. Because I didn't transfer anything from Thailand, so I stored from GD, 
which is a general education, like a high school diploma, but you start from there. You just take the test, and after that, you apply for the college. You study two-year nursing, and then after that, you transfer for four-year nursing. Gotcha. And how was your English before coming to the United States? I know that you didn't study much. I know how Thai people study in their university, or even higher than I, that. I, I, you know, to be honest with you, when I have to do, I have to do, and uh, when I studied, you know, when I take a GED test, and then the teacher said, "I thought you're gonna fail on the reading part, but the first time I failed the, uh, I, I failed re reading part, but." I passed the written part, and then she like, I thought you're gonna fail written part because you are grandma. Son. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And she, How long ago was that? I like a 2000, uh, 2006. 2006. 2006. And so then you arrived here in two thousand four. Four, and then I okay. try. I mean, I met. I met it, and then. So How I old were you when you were in two thousand four? Twenty three, twenty four. This is what I would like to point out to everyone who will listen to this slide. You know, even if you are not good at your English, eventually you can succeed if you want to. If you push yourself, you want to do what you like, you can actually be like her. Um, she studied not only English, but also nursing in the United States, which in Thailand, she didn't even do that, right? No. You graduate from like plant pathology or something yeah, like that. It has nothing to do. Almost plant pathology. <laughs> only the word that we have common is necrosis. <laughs> necrosis. <laughs> Sorry, there's, all right. necrosis. There's nothing to do. Nothing to do with nursing at all, like zero. Maybe, yeah, you okay. nurse the plant, but oh, not my, human, right? Uh, um, uh, more, almost like a biology and um, part of the biology side of microbiology because I have to study microbiology in the United States would be good. Can yeah, I guess I know that a lot of people from Thailand would like to become a nurse here. Yes. Or even many of my nurse friends who graduate from Thailand want to move over to the United States, but it's so difficult to get here. Do you have some advice for them? I they have the I, I met some Thai Thai nurses. They still have to go to the process, take the enclave and take the and do that enclave and some English too. They have to do it. Yeah, it. I'm a little bit different because yeah. I start nursing here. I have to do it. I cannot fail. That's all I have to. I cannot fail. I cannot. The family in Thailand wait for my money. I have to pass. See, I, 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 have I to told pass. you guys. So uh, if you have enough determination, you can do whatever you want, including coming over here and to become a nurse. And you are quite successful uh, from the story I heard from you. I'm satisfied. I, I mean, I made decent money as a nurse practitioner. I can, I mean, come here. It's like, oh, I'm just go. It's not make good, decent money, but a little bit hard on the, uh, but life balance because in the urgent care they have only one provider so it's hard for me to take on yeah this is but the rest of that is the education my daughter now she is in college study bio medical engineer wow that's a very awesome field her, she said she don't want to do the bedside nursing or she don't want to do bedside as a doctor she said she wants to do something with medical field, but not the bedside. Sure. I so, think that's uh, that's interesting enough. You know, it doesn't matter what you want to do with your life. It's not because your parents want you to do yeah. certain things. It just have to be you who wants to do certain things. Yes, yeah, that's true. And my husband like, oh, you're going to go to the medical school. Outlet. You're smart. You're intelligent. She told, he told the daughter, but the daughter said, ah, I do what I want. Well, bioengineering, if you're smart, that's very good, right? She's pretty smart. That's awesome. Well, let me introduce you to my field. Um, I rarely talk about lung transplant on this channel, including, um, well, I, I did talk about it a little bit, but not too much in details because this might be a little bit too much. But, you know, I don't care about that anymore today. It's just because typically if I have a student with me, that's what I'm supposed to be teaching them anyway. So the field of lung transplant in for the lung, it started back in 1982, and that was when the first successful lung transplant happened. Um, the lung transplant itself can be very challenging because prior to that, we know that the people would not accept other people's organs because we are different in something. And initially, nobody knows what that something is. 
eventually they found out there's something called human leukocyte antigen or HLA, which another name of this HLA is known as major histocompatibility complex or MHCs. It's called major histocompatibility complex because it is the major determinant whether you can be compatible with somebody else's body or not. So we know about this molecule. Now we can develop the medication that can take care of this and make your donor accept organs that we're gonna donate to, to the recipient. Now what is next is we have a lot of end stage problem like end stage lung disease, uncurable heart disease, uncurable kidney disease, kidney failure, and so much more. Currently with current technology, we cannot cure them. Then what next? Are we gonna leave them to die? Uh, is there no hope in the future? Well, then no. Now we do have transplant. So if you were to have end stage lung disease and we figure out a way to get the lung from those who are diseased and transplant into your, your body, you live longer. And that's the concept of transplant. That's why we do this to help people. Now, when we do this, the major consequences doesn't matter what you do with your immune suppression medications or how well you take care of yourself. Eventually, your body is going to find ways to reject the new organs. Lung is by far the most difficult organ to be transplanted. And the reason for that, it is because the lung is the only organ that's ex exposed to the environment. Uh, right? Yes. So you inhale something funny every day. You might you know, chew something and then choke on it and get to the lung. You might have some acid in your stomach or bile in your stomach and find it way to come up here and then go down to your lung. And what those things do to the lung is that kind of trigger immune response in the lung. And therefore you can actually reject the lung because of this. And these are constant threat every day, right? You inhale something every day. You cannot not breathe, right? True, true. <laughs> but other organs such as kidney, liver, heart, they're buried inside your body. There's nothing that can go inside and touch them. So therefore it's easier to transplant those organs. They have a lot longer lifespan. Oh. So for instance, gotcha. heart transplant or kidney transplant, you know, heart transplant at least uh, maybe 10 years or more. Kidney, sometime even more than that. But for lung, on average, it's about six and a half years. Six and a half years, is quite good already. Some people live longer than that because, you know, for some reason we don't understand all the immune systems as much as we could. But um, I follow some patient who is like now 30 years after transplant, 20 years after transplant, they're still alive. It's not having a problem. But however, some patients does not, um, it is not that lucky. They die within the first year. I've seen that already. So that's, that's the majority of the, the crux of lung transplant. Why is it so difficult? Why um, people get to lung transplant? They want to live another life. And you know what? I do this because it's very satisfying. Once you can make one patient or more better, that's very satisfying. You, you see someone who is almost dying when you evaluate them. They are almost going to pass away if you don't do anything about that. And eventually you transplant them, get them through the hardship of post-transplant care. They get better. And after they get better, uh, they come by and you don't, and you see them on the street. You think, well, that's like normal human being. It's, it's not like, if I don't know them before, I don't think that they ever got any transplant done in the past. It just look like normal people. Uh, and what's touching is that eventually when these patients are well enough, they try to contact their donor's family to thank them, right? So they write a letter and we hand the letter over to the family and see if they are able to connect or not. So you know, sometimes sometime people just wanna be in private, they don't wanna connect, but some family they do wanna connect because they wanna see how things are with a with new, uh, new patients getting their loved one's lung and they meet. You know what they do? They use a stethoscope and listen to the lungs. I saw the video about the heart before. Too. Yes. So they do that. What they tell the family and, and people is that, you know, my daughter continue to live on in your body. And that's what mattered to me. Oh. 
it's a good story. Yeah. It's as I can see that. So it's very, very touching. So this this is the reason why we work on transplant as hard as we are doing right now. Try to push the boundary, try to make it better so that people who get transplant live longer and have better outcome. Okay. So, so that's the major thing about transplant. Now, since uh, you're on my rotation, how I normally educate my new fellows or student comes my way is that I have to tell you what's the difference between the old lung and the new lung. Yes, sir. This will be great. Right? Because normal people lungs with a transplant lung, they're, they're not the same. They're totally different things. So start from the anatomy. So when you first transplant somebody else's lung, lung has two major circulations. Bronchial artery, which is considered systemic artery, and pulmonary artery, which is another system. So typically, lung have these two circulations, with the bronchial artery being two-thirds of the circulations, and pulmonary artery is one-third of that. In lung transplant, though, we do not reconnect bronchial artery, which means you are left with one circulation, which is pulmonary artery. So any little thing done to your lung and your lung's not doing well, then what happens is that your lung does not, ex did not receive enough blood supply and therefore it will die. So you have to be so careful about that. And pulmonary artery and systemic artery, the differences for those who don't understand is systemic artery has higher pressure and pulmonary artery is a low pressure, which means you're now depending on the pulmonary artery, which is low pressure going out so anything that disrupts the flow can cause the flow to cease very easily, okay? And pulmonary artery, even if the name sounds artery, it's supposed to be like oxygenated blood, but it's not. Pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood. And in fact, it's the only artery in the entire human body that carries deoxygenated blood. So you think of it coming off the heart, deoxygenated, it has to go all the way through the periphery uninterrupt in between because if there's some in interrupting thing it won't go there and when it's get to the end point of the lung which is the alveoli it get all the gas exchange needed so it get more oxygen into the blood it gets carbon dioxide out of the blood through the capillary network and then after the capillary network it become a pulmonary vein and then pulmonary vein carry all the blood back to the heart right, to be yes. pumped out through the entire body. When it's carried back the blood, these is oxygenated blood. So they're gonna start perfusing the lung. So you can see, you pound out the oxygenated blood, it doesn't do anything. When it comes back, it carries oxygen with them and start perfusing. Now the furthest point of the perfusion is actually the airway anastomosis. So there is a bronchus, which is the main airway, goes left and right, and each one of them will have to connect with the donor's bronchus. So it's connect like this, right? There must be some arteries or oxygen supply to this area, otherwise it will die. Guess what? What actually supplying this is pulmonary vein that comes back. Mm. So it comes backward with to perfuse this. In that. And this is the furthest point ever from, from, the, from the start of the pulmonary veins which means they have to do retrograde perfusion, and that's, and that's very, very tough. So therefore, any disruption in between can cause your anastomosis to fall apart. And that's what you have to be very careful about because you want to have one circulation and there's a backward circulation as well. That's one other thing. Wow. Number two, your new lung, they do not have nerve. We do not reconnect nerve. What that means to you is when you swallow something down and that something get past the bronchial anastomosis down the lung, you will not feel a thing. Mm. Typically, if you choke on food, you chew something and it gets down, you cough, right? It's, it's just your reflex. New lung does not have that reflex yet. So if things fall down your lung, you won't know about it. So we typically have the patient cough purposefully, like every now and then, just cough, just check on to see if there's anything got stuck inside it, get it out, okay? Otherwise, if it gets stung down there for too long, pneumonia happens, right? It also impedes the blood flow, so the blood flow can get worse because something gets stuck in there. 
right? So the nerve is not there. The blood circulation is backward and it's low pressure. And we only have one circulation. Is it only one and a half? Yeah. And it's not only that. The next step Ooh. is that we do not have lymphatic channel. Oh, no. The, uh, typically, every organ is supposed to be having lymphatic channels, and they carry nutrients as well as immune cells. However, in the new lung, we don't have the most lymphatic channel. What that means is if you give fluid to the patients, it goes through the lung. Typically, it will come out of the lung into the extracellular space, and the lymphatic channel is supposed to get those fluid back into circulation. Now you don't have that. Guess what? you're gonna get fluid overload in your lung very easily. And fluid overload in your lungs make your lung very stiff. When your lung is stiff, blood supply become less. And therefore your lung can die, which means you have to make sure your lungs are always dry. If you give a little bit of fluid, like IV saline or something like that, you have to be very careful not to give too much. Sometimes you give too much, your lung gets wet and then it doesn't look good. You have more problems. So that's what you have to be aware of. Is it the same principle, like a keep IV fluid for the people that have CHF? Is it the same thing? It's a different thing because CHF or congestive heart failure, they have overdeveloped lymphatic channel yeah. more than normal. Okay. More than normal. So they can be absorbed. However, their hearts are not pumping well. So when their heart's not pumping well, the more fluid you give them, the heart becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. When your heart is stretched out, their, their pumping mechanism become impaired. This is what we call Frank Starling curve or Frank Starling law. I'm not oh. sure if you heard about this. Yes, I heard, but not know a lot about that. Just... So, so Frank Starling curve is actually how do you determine what is the optimal length of your muscle fiber to produce the best force of contraction. Too much of a stretch, you don't produce enough force. Too little of stretch, you don't produce enough force either. Just like when you when you do uh, weightlifting, if you're gonna curl something, right, your muscle output is the best when you're right around the middle. So you can carry something very heavy. But if it's like this, when you're stretched out, it's very hard for you to lift it up here. That's the same thing as Frank starting curve, but it happens in the heart. So if your heart now being stretched because their pumping mechanism is not good to begin with, and you add more fluid into it, it's gonna do this, balloon up, and then it doesn't pump anything. And when it doesn't pump anything, where does it go? Back up to the lung, leak out in the lung, cause pulmonary edema. That's what I'm uh, scared the most when I work in urgent care, you know, some patient come in and say, I want IV fluid for gastroenteritis, and I said, well, oh, your heart, your lung, I just cannot give to you. And we don't know kidney function either. I mean, even we have CMP machine at home. So that kind of like. Well, a couple of things that you can do to understand that. Number one is you can ask them whether you have ki kidney or heart problem to begin with or not. If you do, you may have to be a little bit more careful on it, right? If you don't, the next thing you do is to evaluate two things. Number one, what is your fluid status right now? how would you determine the flu status? You can have the patient sit like this and look at their JVD it's very easily, right? You can shine the light right here and see how tall their veins is. If it's just like below your mandible, like midway here, you're still fine to give them a little bit more fluid. But if it's like right up here at your angle, uh, you should not be giving them any more fluid, right? Yes. And um, sometimes you don't know whether they have heart problems. I can just ask them, you know, when you lay down at night, you get short of breath very often like you have to wake up several times a night, right? It's called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or PND. Or do you have to prop yourself up with several pillows, like two, three pillows, just to be able to breathe at night? If you do, maybe you have some kind of heart problem to begin with. I should be very careful about giving fluid to you, right? So you can look at here, you can look at the swelling in the legs. Um, sometimes some certain people, they, um, they don't, walk that much. So they lay on their back most of the time. So their swelling would be in the back, not their legs, because oh. it's the most dependent part of your body when you lay down, right? So you evaluate how much fluid they carry. If they don't carry any of this excessive fluid, then you can rest assured you can give them a little bit more fluid, like 500 or, or a liter of something, oh. right? Yeah, so maximum that we normally do one liter. Mm -hmm. Then you can actually ask them, you know, 
um, gastroenteritis, how many how many bowel movement you have in the past 24 hours? What is a lot each time coming out? Are you thirsty, right? If you're thirsty, that's a sign that you're dehydrated to begin with, right? You can look at their overall well-being. Their tongues are dry, you know, they don't produce tears in kids, something like that. If, if that's the case, then you can give them a little bit more fluid and a liter will be, would be my guess it is good enough, you know. They should not be tachycardic. If they're tachycardic, mm, well, you may be having something wrong with you. Either your blood pressure is low because you're dehydrated or because your heart's not pumping well, one way or the other. But if you're in that extremis, giving them like 500 to a liters should be enough to send them to the hospital. Because if you don't think they're doing well, just send them over. It's not safe to just keep it, keep the patient with you. True. Right? Because in the urgent care, we have two options. They charge home, follow up with primary care doctor. Yeah. Or go to the ER. Yeah. So this is how the, uh, the in all of this about. So you have to be aware that um, when you, when you, practice in the United States, sometimes you can actually see the urgent care, which is different than in Thailand. Uh, we, we don't have urgent care in Thailand. So, so that's something that we have to be concerned about, you know? Okay. Uh, not sure. Let's see if, if any of these have um, questions. Well, somebody already did redact their message because they post something that is offensive to us. Anyway, I was able to read it in time. So be careful next time, Mr. Around Me. Um, I don't let things slide, you know? My eyes very sharp and very fast. So if you do that again, you're out of my life. Oh, actually, I can block you very easily. I'm very, very cruel to this, you know? So in the United States, I, I'm not sure if Thai people are aware of this. In the United States, harassment is a, is a major thing. Harassment, bullying, um, sexual harassment in workplaces. These are con considered crime and you can be expelled like right away. It doesn't matter how, how big you are. And, you know, those patients, we, even if the patients or a doctor who harass each other, they're out. Right. And uh, I have to go through harassment training myself. I'm not sure if you have to do the same thing when you start your job. A little bit. I think they not get put, put in a lot of it because no, not, not a lot. Yeah, but uh, sexual harassment or anything like that is is part of nursing when we learn. Yeah, when so we, we like when I first start, I have to do this training for for the harass harassment training. So if we were have to, to deal with anyone who harass us, either our boss or somebody else, we we can report them, and then the investigation will start. When the investigation start there's something called no retaliation policies, which means, well, if you, if you report something, report your boss, for instance, your boss may, may sometimes think that you're, you're not good to me, I'm gonna cause harm to you, or kick you out or give more problem to you, something like that. So that's something that we look into very, very seriously. True, true. Retaliation is the big thing after you've been reported. So if, if there are retaliations, um, the I think the problem to the person who retaliate you get even larger. There's a policy to, to prevent that from happening. But if it does happen, then that person get double the consequences. So yes. So make sure you don't do that, um, especially if you are from Thailand, you come over to the United States. Never do that, even if it's a joke for you. Yes. Because that's not a joke for any of the Americans. I, I, for example, I actually give the cough medication, the new cough medication. I'm not sure it's made to it. ninja cough. Mm. You have heard about the ninja cough, the uh, cough no. syrup. It's, it's on the sound right now, but yeah. So the urgent care should not get the sample because we are urgent care. We not follow up. So the drug representative give me the ninja cough. And then I gave to the people, the CSR, the medical assistant work there. And she claimed that she had allergic reaction to that. I don't know her medical background, but she said she had cough. She had upper respiratory infection, post cough after she'd been affected by the flu. So I gave, and then she said, she went to tell everyone, Sandy tried to kill me. She gave her 
cough medication. She mm. gave me cough medication. Sandy tried to kill me. And three or four days later, I come back, and then one of the front desk, we call PSO, and said, Sandy, I heard you tried to kill medicine. And I like, what do you mean by that? You give mm -hmm. her cough medication, and she have, she said, she tell another nurse practitioner, you tried to kill her. Mm -hmm. And I like, oh, that's not going to happen. So I report that. I asked her, I asked the nurse practitioner that she is speaking to. I mean, she's speaking to. I asked the nurse practitioner, uh, another witness, and then they said one of the CRs, or I mean, medical assistant, and he said, yes, she said that five times, Sandy. And finally, I had to stop her. So I report to the manager that now it's on going on investigation because she that is bad. Yeah. Well, sometimes when people don't like each other, they just try to cause harm and cause more trouble to people. So, and we don't want that. So um, that, that car is like a on, yeah. going on right now. Then I run to that, you know, like, yeah, this well, is I a, try to kill you. This is a serious problem. Yes. You know, for, for us in the United States, it's, it's not so much in Thailand. I mean, there's a lot of discrepancy in Thailand, hierarchy, those kind of things in Thailand. And, and many people are still, you know, make fun of it or jokes around. And when they get caught, they just oh sorry I didn't know about that you know I that's, just I just do that. This is a yeah. that is a good point out that in time in the United States you just cannot joke so kind of thing you cannot make a joke of it. That's correct because uh, for my friend perspective and that's my livelihood and then if the patient overheard what the CSR said, she the nurse practice Sandy tried to kill that person. her. How about us? Did she gonna try to kill us too? Yeah. So that car is a big, big yeah. deal. So never, never do joke. that joke at all. I would say, you know, typically, definitely, if you come over to the United States, never perform such a joke. However, I would suggest you not to do it at all, even you're in Thailand, because uh, some people will not find that amusing at all. And uh, it may be burdensome to their thought process. And some people get depressed because of that. They get threaten or get anxious about it and it's not a good thing to do so you know sometime what i would suggest you do is before you say anything think about saying the same thing over to yourself or to your mom or your dad what are they gonna feel if you say the joke out and you if you use this joke um with your dad for instance your mom and they would say you know this is inappropriate or this is not good don't ever do that to anyone else because that's serious all right well, thank you for those who uh, supported here. Now let's uh, move on to a little bit of the next things. So when we do transplant, um, we don't have lymphatic channel, we don't have bronchial artery, we don't have nerves. Typically, how your lungs are clearing phlegm is by something called mucociliary clearance escalators. You know why people make a lot of phlegm, phlegm or sputum, what we call in, in medical field. We call it sputum, but uh, many, many people will either call it phlegm or mucus. Uh, they cough up. And there are a lot of questions about why would you make it in the first place and you know how to get rid of it. Typically, I would have to say all humans' lung produce mucus, but it's not to the point where you cannot clear it. So production is not too much, and your lung can actually clear it using mucociliary clearance, which is actually a small, fine furs in your lung that move the mucus up here and then you cough it up. It's like a cilia? Yeah, it's cough. a cilia. Okay. So it's just move things up and then you cough it up. Um, lung transplant, that mechanism is lost for a bit. Oh. Because the lung's been outside the patient's body for quite some time, so they suffer the ischemic consequences, which means they don't receive the blood supply, so their cell become dysfunctional, and therefore these mechanism is kind of like a stun for a little, a little while. Typically, it takes like weeks to months to start coming back. Uh, so initially, it's not working. So we are impaired in terms of clearance of the mucus. We don't have nerve to send if the mucus is there, right? The third thing, if there's inflammation, your body is going to produce more mucus. Inflammation such as you swallowing something down and injure your lungs all the time, like those who are very old, patients and you know they lay in the bed all the time they swallow something in the wrong channel go down to their lungs 
and they start having mucus because of this. Or well, they have acid reflux get into the lung, they have more mucus. They have allergy that gets to the lung, they have more mucus. These are why we have mucus. And some patients, um, I will just give you a very good example because many of people in this YouTube channel ask me is that, you know, my loved one um, is now in the hospital with pneumonia and he's in the ICU. Doctors come over to ask us, you know, we have to do a tracheostomy. We have to put a breathing tube right here in the neck. Um, and then he did that. Now the problem after that is that why do my loved one have a lot of mucus that have to be suctioned all the time? Can we not do suction? Is there a medication to make it go away? You know, because each suction cause the patients to be having some pain or discomfort because something goes down their throat that's not supposed to be there. So I would say, if you were to have pneumonia, your body have inflammation in your lungs or in your airway. You start producing more mucus because of that. These mucus is trying to catch all these bacteria and kill it. When the bacteria is do too much to be killed, they keep producing more mucus and more mucus, right? And the inflammation starts from there. And then what happened next? Typically when you produce mucus, you're supposed to be able to expel the mucus out of your body with the bacteria in it. And now you're not able to do that. So guess what? It gets stuck in there. When the mucus gets stuck in there, eventually the bacteria will not go away. It will just be there and reproduce to become more bacteria. And these way you have constant mucus production. It doesn't go away at all. So that is why you need to do a suction through the trach until all the mucus is gone. It's gonna reproduce, but you have to make sure it's gone all the time. With this and only this, that there will be a chance that you will no longer produce too much mucus. So you see what I'm saying? Like yes. we, we're trying to get all this out. We're not trying to torture patients by all putting right. a suction down your tracheostomy tube, but because we want to clear all this, otherwise we know you're not going to heal. And when you're not going to heal, you may have a chance to get a medication um, that may be toxic to you, uh, try to kill all these organisms, and then eventually you develop something called multi drug resistant organism in your lung. It's a vicious cycle that's keep going yes. and going, uh, and therefore we need to make sure they are taken care of. Same with lung transplant. Your lungs are outside the body for about, who knows how long, maybe three hours, six hours, and they got the injury because they don't have enough blood supply during that time period. So when you're transplanting them, they start producing more mucus because of this. So you need to make sure patient cough all the mucus up we go down with a bronchoscopy and suction all these mucus up. So therefore the lung will become dry without anything inside. And then blood circulation will be optimized. So, so that's a, I that's see. the thing. So, so, you know, the, like the patient that come urgent care, they like, Oh, I cough so much. I want cough suppression. When they have the productive cough, then they don't need the cough suppression. Then it's expectorant. Mm -hmm. They need expectorant, yes. So you, you don't wanna suppress anybody else's cough when you have a lot of phlegm because it gets stuck in there and they can cause inflammation and you know sometimes it can cause people to have difficulty breathing How because the, the mucus is stuck. Also, the word yeah. mucus plugs. So you have too much mucus, it uh -huh. plugs on your airway and guess what? If you have the airway leading to your lung that got plugged, well the air that you breathe in doesn't get gas exchange. So you, you don't have enough oxygen, you get more out of breath. So the treatment of that is to not give you oxygen, is to have you cough it up. Cough it up, yes. Okay. If you cannot cough it up, we have to find some way. So the expectorant or mucolytic medication that make your phlegm a little bit more slimy so it can cough it up. Um, that's something we use, like you can take a pill, but if that does not work, and most of the time it does not work for lung transplant patients, what we do, we do a combination of bronchodilators and then saline. Oh. So such as we do albuterol or in Thailand, it calls salbutamol. It's the same exact medication or Ventolin if you never heard about it. We do that and then follow by saline, about three cc's of saline to nebulize in. And this way, bronchodilators, they open up the airway, right? The bronchodilators not only open up the airway, it does one more thing that not a lot of people know about this it accelerate the ciliar movement. So your cilia might not move, 
and then you give this bronchodilator, it start moving like this to get things out. So bronchodilator does that. And then we give saline so that your phlegm that is very, very sticky become loose. And then you can cough it up. We do that several times a day. Also, we give them cough assisting device. It's something that you blow into. It kind of vibrates inside, causing these mucus to loosen up and lump together and it's easy to cough it up. Is it, is it a spirometer or the different? No, it's just different thing. Okay. So there's one thing called incentive spirometry. Yes. What that is, is try to prevent atelectasis or um, squishing of their lungs. So what you do is you take big breath. There's a thing with one ball or sometimes they have three balls in it. You inhale deeply to open up your lungs. And, and that's what we call incentive spirometry. That's to keep your lungs open nice. However, the flutter valve, acapella valve or something that you do, which is a cough assistance device, you blow into it, it vibrates does not cause your lung to expand or anything. It just caused all this secretion to lump together okay. and then you cough it up. Okay. So these two devices can be used together, I see. right? So you can use one or the other. It depends on what you like to do. And if you have more phlegm, you use more of these, the, the flutter valve. If you have more of the atelectasis problems, such as your after surgery or something like that, you use incentive spirometry more. So that's how you use. This makes sense. Okay. So this is how we we, we know like what's the difference between the older, uh, the native lung versus transplanted lung. Okay. Wow. It's complicated more than just slap the lungs in there. <laughs> no, it is. It's a lot more complicated. And the thing is with, with lung transplant, it's not easy because it's a lifelong journey. That you, you take this lung and put it in and the patient have to follow up with you the rest of their life. They have to take certain medication every single day, the rest of their life. It's not just like I transplant you and you're done. It's unlike other kind of surgery where you got out of surgery, you recover, and then you're good. You go home, you don't need to do anything much. You can just follow up with us maybe one or two times and then that's it. Lung transplant, no, you have to follow up the rest of your life with us. Medication you're taking will also have side effect because we are suppressing your immune system so that it does not attack the new lung, All right? So the medication we use to suppress the immune system, we have three of them. One of them is called calcineurin inhibitor. So what calcineurin is, is something in the cells that cause your cell especially immune cells to reproduce and cause trouble to the new lung. We don't want that. We want to stop the immune system from attacking the lung. So therefore we want to stop one, one thing inside the cell. So these categories of medications, there are two main medications in this category. The best one is tacrolimus. I saw that before on the mm -hmm. third kind of uh, Mm, kidney transplant when they come to us and yeah. yeah, we use the same thing. The part is the same, right? What they come for some another reason. Yeah. So typically taclimus, the steroids, and then the third that. one is usually mycophenolate or azathioprine. So these are the backbone of every lung, every organ transplant, kidney, okay. liver, heart. We use the same medication. Okay. But sometimes we had you the difference is the amount of medication used in each patient. So the heart transplant or or liver or kidney, they use less immune suppression because remember, these are organs that's buried inside your body. So they are not exposed to the environment and therefore they don't have a lot of immune reactivations, not lung. Lung gets exposed to something, their means are always reactive. I got it. So Even therefore you have to use Higher, higher immune dose. suppression. And higher immune suppression means more side effect. Your immunes are more suppressed. suppressed. It's easy to get infection. Yes. So that's why you have to be very, very careful when you're on immune suppression. Your response to the vaccine is not that good, right? You get right, sick right. very easily. When other people, they don't get sick. Like, I mean, if you have COVID with lung transplant, um, you might be sicker than other people who does not have lung transplant because you're on these medications. Is it, uh, with the people with the COVID, is it like asthma and COPD have the same problem? It take them longer, get sicker? 
it takes them well it, they get more sick sick when they have these infections because of their native lung problem to begin with like copd or obstructive lung disease they don't clear their carbon dioxide that well and sometimes they have issues with their oxygenation as well so when they have this any little inflammation in the lung can cause them to be very very symptomatic true asthma the same thing i mean anything that triggers something inflaming in their lung their airway do this it's squished down and then you have asthma exacerbations and that's the problem with these people who have lung problems it doesn't matter whether it's asthma copd there can be other kind of lung problems such as um cystic fibrosis yeah cystic fibrosis insufficient pneumonitis pulmonary fibrosis and, and many more cystic fibrosis many of the thai people i don't think they know about this I don't think we have a lot in Thailand. Maybe. There's zero in Thailand, maybe one or oh, really? nobody knows about the cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is basically a um, the disease that affect the entire human body, but more so in the lung. What it does is that it causes your cells to produce a lot more sticky mucus in the lung, and they have a lot of phlegm inside. When they have a lot of phlegm that cannot be clear all the time, they get infection. They got all the inflammation in their lung, and they have a hard time breathing. That's the main feature of the uh, cystic fibrosis in the lung. However, it also affects other things, much, such as your pancreas. So your pancreas cannot secrete enough um, uh, digestive enzyme. Like so base, amylase, and everything. Everything, okay. everything. So pancreas is actually the organ that can secrete enzyme that digests everything: protein, fat. Carbohydrate, unlike stomach, which has more of the protein um, digestive enzyme, like pepsin, right, hydrochloric acid, they can digest some of the starch. They can digest very little of fat because they have something called gastric lipase. They can digest some, but gastric lipase is like nothing, just very very minimal. The the thing that can cause digestion of your fat more and more is actually from the pancreas. And the pancreas has to secrete this enzyme into the pancreatic duct and gets to the to the small bowel in the duodenum uh, second portion. So duodenum, there's a C shape like this. There are four portion one, two, three, four, and the second portion there is a ampulla here where the uh, pancreatic ducts comes out here, as well as the bile duct will come out here. So you secrete things out there. Okay. So what if this digestive enzyme become very very thick? It cannot come out. Because so thick, so viscous, so when that happens, this actually happened in cystic fibrosis. So what happened next is, well, the digestive enzyme does not come out, so therefore, cystic fibrosis having a hard time digesting fat. They cannot digest most of the food, and therefore, anything that requires fats to absorb, such as fat-soluble vitamin A, D, E, and K, oh. are not absorbed. So they are having a hard time with this problem. They're not absorbing the vitamins, and they're not able to digest. So therefore, you need to give them vitamin supplementations. You have to give them digestive enzyme mm. to take with each meal and snacks. I cannot remember the name of the Cree stuff. It's, it's Creon. I almost got it. There's a lot of them, like Creon, Zenpep, Viocase. So there, there are a lot of them, but. If you're not using them most of the time, I mean, it's you don't need to remember, no, but I just need to know like it. there there's something wrong about it. Like you're not secreting the things. This makes sense. Yeah, and eventually, well, when you have a lot of mucus to get stuck in your pancreas, one another important feature of pancreas is that produce insulin. Right, right. So what if you are um, occluding all the pancreatic duct and this digestive enzyme does cannot come out of the pancreas. Where does it go then? It's still in the pancreas and then start auto-digesting the pancreas. And the cell in the pancreas dies. When these cell dies, you're not producing insulin yes, and therefore they will become diabetic. Type one. Yeah. So they have diabetes, they have pancreatic insufficiency, they have lung problem. And not only that, what if their digestive enzyme, uh, their colon, their small bowel does not produce any lubricants or fluid inside that area because it's so thick it cannot come out. You have bad constipation, very, very bad constipation. Or bowel obstruction? 
yeah, sometimes bow of production. And so these are things that happen to them. There are a lot more, but these are the major consequences of cystic fibrosis, which in Thailand, Thailand I don't think they have it. Um, but this is actually caused by the mutation in your gene. Yes. There are many, many mutation um, in the something called CFTR mutation. So CFTR mutation, there are a lot of them, like G551B, Delta F508. The most common one is Delta F508. And fortunately, these days we have drugs, something called Trikafta. So since Trikafta came out, many of our trans, many of our uh, cystic fibrosis patients, instead of being admitted to the hospital multiple times because of their lung infection, they're able to spend more time outside the hospital. They're not as sick anymore. Some people who are on transplant list can actually came off transplant list because Trikafta. So there's a magic pill that people take. Well, unfortunately, in Thailand, I don't think we we see any of the of this um, patient at all in, in Thailand. So you you'd be surprised if you come over to the United States and start seeing cystic fibrosis patient for the first time. That's the thing. And then in nursing school. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of people talk about this. And actually, you know, if you're on service with me and we're not talking about lung transplant, we go down into the molecular part of each of these disease, so we understand. Because to me. Many people, they have bad score during their rotation uh, as a medical student or something. It's not because they don't know, but, but they don't understand the importance of it. If they know like how things work, then it's getting easier and easier for them to understand. I, I, I agree with that. You know, what you, you know, with the nursing degree, sometimes the anatomy part is not there. It's not deep. It's just anatomy. Mm -hmm. But anatomy is the, the really important for me. Like when you start know anatomy, know a mechanism part where you know functional, if you understand it better. You ex actually you explain better for the patient too. Yeah. Because I see in urgent care EMT that almost like a number one UTI EMT is a number one try to explain the patient. But mm -hmm. actually, I got from your video to watch it. To yeah. explain it for the patient, I, I watch your video and explain to the patient that way. That's very good. Yes, and then the patients that oh, you are very smart, and I, oh, I just watched the video <laughs> <laughs> two or three minutes ago. Well, I'm glad that it's helped it, it people actually, out. It's actually helped because it's the patient explain to the patient why mechanism of signal or the disease process if you know that mm -hmm. it's actually help the patient understand and right they and then become more compliant to your comply to your and understand teaching, yeah so because if you say oh we just left you with antibiotic you have sinus infection and mm -hmm. you know even explain like why your mucus is so when you have cold after respiratory uh, after respiratory infection why your mucus is so thick and green and then the, for the more general patient, we'll say, oh, I got infection now. I got green mucus. And we said, no, still virus. You have seen yeah. just two days ago. Yeah. So uh, I think this is important to know. Even if these are patients in the United States, yes. they don't always know things. No. no. Don't expect like we have smarter patients than Thai patients. So, you know. Even United States patients who you think might have higher education, they don't understand a thing. So we need to educate them still. Otherwise, they will believe in something that is not supposed to be true, and then they get stuck with that. So we we will always have to educate both Thai and and um, United States patients, which is something what we do. And the more we know, the, the more they understand. And as I always mention, like all the knowledge I acquire over time is not because of my teacher. To me, I have to be straight. I don't care about teacher. Like I don't go to lecture, expect my professor to tell me everything that needs to know for the exam or something like that. Or I just don't expect like, okay, this book has everything I need to know about certain disease. So therefore I start reading it. What I care about is when I go out and practice on my own and I see actual problems, how am I able to tackle that problems appropriately? Is my knowledge good enough? Maybe my knowledge is good enough to go through this exam and ace the exam without a problem. 
but it may not be good enough for a real world problem when I see. That's my problem. That's why I have to get more education. So the thing is that I I can take the test and pass the test. Like I don't care about the teacher anymore. Mm -hmm. I just okay. The teacher is there to guide yes, you. Yes, sir. What you should be reading. When I expect, okay, I have this problem. I don't understand. You know, the teacher is supposed to be the one who is tell you. Oh, maybe you can look at this literature. Maybe this book would help you out. Go read about it. I think teacher is supposed to be doing that for you, and guide you if you're going down the wrong path. But it's your yourself. Like you have to learn how to learn. You have to be interested in something that's useful to you. So it's all come down to your passion. If you are passionate about something, you really want to be good at it. Then you start thinking about how to learn. So you go into reading more. Like cystic fibrosis, I just gave you an example. Is well, people learn about it. Delta F five O eight. This is how we treat it, and these are our manifestation. Now, if you go into molecular biology, you understand like why is the mucus sticky? Maybe because chloride channel, bicarbonate, and the exchange channel. Those kind of things. You start wondering like why is things happen. Right, and then you read more and more, you understand more and more. So first of all, be curious about many things. It's a good thing for you, and don't stop there. When you're curious about things, go find the answer yourself. Try the hardest. Do not just rely on the teacher or someone to feed you the knowledge because that's not going to happen in the real world. But anyway, but to, today I'm going to be only speak English, so so nothing in Thai. Um, so if you ask me a question. Uh, I might not be answering that much, but we'll we'll talk about certain things. Yes. We'll we'll see what what they say about that. Well, his English is perfect. <laughs> I, my I English, say that. my English, no. So, so one one thing about English. So most of the Thai people will learn English by um, writing, reading, grammar has to be grammatically correct, right? Everything has to be perfect. Um, but that's not true. When you are here, you want to be able to communicate with people um, and make them understand. It doesn't matter if your accent sucks or you you misspoke something or your grammar is not good. My grammar is not perfect, by the way. When I write something, I have to still have to rewrite the sentence or I read it second time to make sure my grammar is correct. Uh, and sometimes when I um, when I speak English, things are not flowing. As though I were to speak Thai back in the days, but I don't care. I mean, as long as I can carry my set message across to the other person, that would be fine, right? I mean, yes. your your English is not perfect either, right? No. But you're able to work. Work, I have, right? Yes. You you've been working uh, for okay. a long time now, for right? For five years as a nurse practitioner. See, and, and you're still working. I started nursing in two thousand nine. Yeah. When I first came, one of my preceptors said. I'm not sure she gonna make it through nursing because her English is not good. See? I proved him wrong later. He didn't tell me in the from the beginning, but he later on he came back and I said, "This is what I thought about you, but you proved me wrong." Yeah, so it doesn't matter what people think about you. It's about you who think about you yourself. Yeah. So if you think about trusting yourself in in order to achieve something, then you can do it. You know. Yes, you true. can do it. Because I start from zero here, actually yeah. zero. Bring nothing from Thailand. Because I think you're gonna be a very good inspiration for many of the people who are struggling at the moment, um, especially those who would like to come over to United States and they think they're old. No, they are not old. My <laughs> nursing school friend in the nurse practitioner, she in her fifty. Uh huh. Nurse practitioner in her fifties. Her fifty, and then when I went to two year nursing, the lady she just divorced her husband, and she have to leave the low income house, and she in her sixty, and she the smartest nursing student. Met nursing student at the age of sixty, 60 six one. zero. So you can actually start um, learning. Doesn't matter how old you are, uh, opportunity is still open as long as you want it. So I wouldn't say, okay, I'm old. I just don't want to do this anymore. Come over to United States now. I'm like 30 years old, 35 years old. Well, oh. those are considered very young. Young, very, very young. Because yeah. my when we went to nursing school, she is in her 50. Yeah. Great, great nurse practitioner. Very, yeah. very intelligent. Actually, she is my primary care. So, so we the 
because I work in I, urgent care, I cannot be primary care. So she is my primary care. That's actually very good. It's a very good story. So all of you guys who are listening right now, I would suggest that you believe in yourself and there's no such thing as too old to do something. Okay. And then actually I met the nurse practitioner that studied DNP. Never met in person yet, but she lived here in Boston. Can you explain to the audience what a DNP is? A DNP bit? is like a, a, what a doctorate degree in nursing. The, you go more to, I'm not sure how many years they have to go through. It's like a PhD, but yeah. it's through the nursing, the nursing. Doctorate, doctorate of nursing degree. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, I have a friend who is actually doing that. Um, she's from Thailand, but I think she's right now in, in England and doing just that for four years in PhDs. So uh, just like regular PhD, you have to do your um, dissertation and other yes. stuff. Um, Research. Paper. So it's, it's hard. But if it's something you would like to do, you know, you only have to live once. It's, uh, just do it, whatever you feel like doing, because if you come back when you're like 70 or 80 years old, try to reflect on yourself as a younger self, um, you want to be able to tell yourself, there's nothing I would change at all no, no. if I were to be able to go back to my 20s again. I don't want to change a thing. I don't think I'm going to regret anything. When you come out at your, you can think of, okay, are you going to do this or you're not going to do this? The how to make decision is, Think of it this way. If you to see yourself in seven when you're 70 years old and come back and tell you, you know, would you be regretting like that you have not done that or not? If you are not regretting that you're not done that, well, that's good. You can go ahead and not do it. But if you think you may regret that decision in the future, um, that means you have to just go ahead and do it. I'm, All right. I'm thinking about like for my I might not want to do the DNP, but I want to do like public health or something like that at the master degree level. Yeah, public health is a very good degree to do. Um, it has a lot of implications, and most people who are going into this field they must be liking some statistics. Some people don't like it and still becoming a public health um, policy developer or something like that. Um, but status is part of the game anyway. So it, it there cannot be a study that you like everything about it. There must be something you don't like about it. Like for instance, I don't like statistics, but if I had to do something with statistics, I just have to push myself through and be done with it. You know? Yeah, I have to, if I want to do that, I'm looking for it right now just to get another degree. Yeah. I love school. You love school? I love school, but the, for the DNP perspective or PhD, I have, I'm not sure I want to go to teaching because if they no. go, they got PhD, it doesn't mean they plan to be teaching. That's most, true. Most most nurse, nurse practitioner or the nurse and educator, or they go DNP. The for the DNP and the master degree nurse practitioner, the pay scale is not different much. I don't think so. No, no. So that why, I, but I want to acquire more knowledge on something else. Yeah. More advanced, more open, more open up more. Mm -hmm. I think the more you see, the better opportunity can come. So that's why I, I, I kind of recommend many of the Thai people to come over to the United States um, for their further educations. So, I mean, if you come over here and yes. you, don't, you don't like it, you can always go back. Yes, that's But true. if you've never seen anything in the United States, well, you don't know anything. You don't know whether there's something better or no, you better don't, for right? you. True that, because the, even in the state of Alabama, they consider it's really poor state. You still have a ton of opportunity if you chose to do it. Yeah. Like nursing. And I think many people, when you, when you talk to um, many, many other people, people uh, just to get some more ideas and that's a very good thing if you have more networking um different understanding about life different understanding about different subjects may change how you view the world yes. a lot it's not a little you know i thought about like what if i did not make a decision to come over to united states i might be good doctor in thailand i might be still practicing practicing in either a big hospital or something like that but i wouldn't be able to do to understand all the lung transplant and see the opportunity, how how I can help patients yes. and 
this YouTube channel might not be existence. That's true. And I, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So it's actually, yeah, my friend actually want to learn from you too, but they want, but they say, I said, it's all in Thai. I'm sorry. And they're like, well, maybe you can translate it to English for me <laughs> or, or, or to them. Because what is good about this is when you watch my video, when you learn from my videos, yes. the next thing to do is be able to really understand it and to un to make sure you really understand it, you should be able, be able to teach to it. Yep, try, right, right. And if you translate Thai into English and you're able to teach them, that's your success. Well, that means you really understand it. After I watch your video, and then you know, when you watch the first time, you understand a little bit. Then you start do the research more. Yeah. And then you start. Oh, this makes sense. The research more. Because most more. of the most of the topic I talk in in my channel, it's. Uh, it's a little bit more in depth yes. compared to other YouTuber. Yes. A little bit more deep, but it's not very deep yet. If I talk to my student, it's gonna be a lot deeper than that. That's like okay deep for, for normal people, general but public. It's actually like inspired me to learn more, to understand yeah. more. And then you know, we don't learn everything from less practice school either. Mm -hmm. It's just a new subject too, so kind yeah. of thing. Even the mushroom, even the mushroom, I love mushroom. Oh, the mushroom? <laughs> yes. And I start start learning about mushroom in the United States, you know. Yeah. Because I have Thai friends that live in Alabama. She will go foraging mushroom. They actually have more than lion mains. They have, wow, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, mushrooms are good. There are a lot of things uh, about mushroom. I mean, if you use it well, then they can be very helpful Healthy, for you. Yes. Uh, I just like it. It tastes good for me. Yes. You know, I, I never thought about like it can be medicinal or something, but it just tastes good. I just I, love it. I, the, the people, I look at it, the people start looking to the, they make the coffee for it. Oh, yes. So I, I try the daily dose. I, I don't know you, I think they call daily dose the first week uh -huh. when I took it drink that coffee i stay so focused it's a week and after that it's gone i'm like oh what happened here yeah you may have to increase the dose i don't know but i might go get lion man just just lion man capsule or something typically there are like uh many brands of lion man you have to make sure that you're looking for fruiting bodies yeah that not what, the mycelium that what you another thing you touch us about see i like oh because yeah. when okay. you when people look into you know these things the problem with all these supplement yes. product is they're not regulated in that any right. way. Yes, that's true. So no one knows what dose they should be taking. What should they be expecting? How would they know this one is good as compared to other brands? Because other brands are selling the same thing. How will you tell them apart? Right? So first thing I, I tell them, okay, the the regular thing you have to be able to check is how much is actually in there? And is there proof of that? If there's certificate from third party that look into this saying, okay, they have the exact amount of these substances as they claim on the label based on our mass spectrometry that we analyze. Well, that's good then. And how about the third party? Is it like valid third party or it's like someone who invent something out and you don't know about them. So you kind of have to do your research to understand if the third party exists. And if if so, how good are they? Right. So you know the certificates is genuine. And then the next thing you do is to see what's the analysis. If the analysis match the label, then that one is good. When you pass this point, the next thing you want to know is, okay, um, what does this substance do? And what those should I be taking? How would you know about that? You have to look into research. research yes. There's no way around this. There's no like, okay, uh, that patient just asked me See. to take like two grams of this thing, two capsule, four capsule. doesn't make sense to me at all. You have to go through your research paper and see like what, what else I'm be taking. For instance, fish oil. I'm going to tell you this. When you look at fish oil, many of the brand will say, okay, you take one capsule or two, something like that. That's about it. Does it do anything? No. What do you want to get out from the fish oil? If you want to get muscle effect, you need five gram of the, the um, DHA and EPA combined or omega-3. Five grams, maybe one of these brands you need to take 
five capsules. The other brand, you may have to take more than that, like 10 capsules a day. Well, it's not like one or two capsules as the, the label implies. So if you want muscles, <laughs> doesn't help, right? If you want to lower your triglyceride, four grams. Because what they're gonna say on the label is that, okay, these things help lower your triglyceride, help with your cell function, those kind of things. How do you actually know it's gonna help with your function if the dose is not correct? Right. right? So you have to learn about all these things yourself. It's not just like you listen from someone and many of the supplier or the influencer on the internet, they, they just, um, I don't think they know enough. They just say, this thing is good, you know, this um, cocoa mass is good. It can yes. cure your depression, can make you focus, can reduce your um, metabolic disease or something like that. But they don't actually know how much it actually do and what dose you should be taking. And sometimes they just make it up. Like especially cocoa mass, they say it cures depression. You know, abroad they use it a lot. I've never seen one case of my depression patient use these things and it cure things. Never happened. They just make it up so that you feel like, oh, this might be helpful. Why do they do that? To sell their products. Do you want to waste your money without any benefit? I would say no. no. I want to use my money wisely on something that I have enough belief that it's going to work for me. So therefore, you have to do your own research and look into things. And I shy away from recommending any brands to any of the, my followers because you actually asked me like, what brand should I be taking this? What, uh, why? Um, it's just because I don't want to do that. Number one, I want to be having no biases yes. on, on my channel. And I don't want to point out towards certain brand because it might be unfair to other brands as well. So I don't want to do any of that. So you is is your job to study, research, and find the one that works for you and what dose. And I already tell you how to do just that. All right. It start that. Yeah. It start your video actually start some start me to curious more and more and more and more. Yeah. Let's see if there's anything interesting here. Um, yeah, people have to know like each of these, how much you have to think about each of the supplements. Yeah, I think today might be a good way to learn English from, as I mentioned before, the very educational videos or the one who, which has more benefit that not a lot of people are willing to listen. So no. I'm sure of that, you know, because you can you can actually look up on many channels if you're talking about something very educational inspiring those kind of thing there are not a lot of people listening to no, it no. what they're going to listen to is something fun music um, relaxing playing some 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 of those funny, funny videos funny you know video. they are they are more popular and that's why there's not a lot of wise people out there and you should take advantage of that. I say this is because the, the more clever, the more knowledgeable you are right now, you are a lot more knowledgeable than other people in, in the society. And you should use that as your leverage to whatever you want in your life. You're, more, you're now more clever. They're not because they're, they're not knowing about all these things. That's also true with all of you. I mean, you know, the, the best way to practice English is to speak it. Yes. It is not to read it. And uh, if you want to do anything, my suggestion would be you kind of like um, watch certain video that is in English and then each of the sentence that they speak, just pause and then try to say that sentence over and over and over again until you get the accent you will like uh, at that point and you compare with the, with the original accent. And this way, you not only learn the accents, but you learn the way sentence is supposed to be spoken, right? Because over time, like myself, when I was a kid, I don't understand grammar. I don't know what the adjective is, adverb. I don't understand what they are. 
like these how many tenses are there made 12 or 13 or something i don't even understand i don't know what the difference is me neither you know i came from the great uh romian kayai oh god mosam yeah in the mountain yeah like i, I have no idea what those are <laughs> even Ooh. even in my high school so i was lucky enough to be in dreamodom in my high school because you know it got lucky it, i just don't know how i get in there well that but, is uh, the best high school though <laughs> it's the best high school in thailand right and i can tell you even if i'm like my 12th grade before university i know nothing about tenses me neither because i went to the uh, after i finished grade nine i went mm -hmm. to the you know uh the best high school in Lampang. yeah and oh i still don't know anything that wow it's it's long journey yeah and the thing is that even if i don't know tenses my score is always good no i didn't do and that. you know why why because i keep speaking english i speak a lot of english i listen to many of the english show read a lot and then with reading with speaking with listening you know how they speak english properly and what what verb do you use and what adjective do you use where do you place it in the sentence because you speak every single day just like when you speak Thai every day, you know how to speak Thai properly, right? Uh, I, I know it has to be this way to speak Thai properly. It's not like the other way. Why would this word be in front of the other one? Something like that. That's uh, it's, it's hard to memorize, but if you speak it every day, then you know about it. And and with the living in the United States, you get, you get adventure from that. Your friends will collect you too. Yeah. If you hang out. I mean, I heard sometimes i heard the people come they only hang out with tight group oh yes and that don't that. ever don't ever hang out with a lot of tight groups because otherwise you won't learn english <laughs> you will learn thai instead because they we do have group in alabama and then they kind of concern oh, my i want to do this i want to do that but my english is not good and i'm scared that you need to get out of this area go to learn more yeah well, got to, we'll see. Hmm. This Mr. Say Hello guy, I think she's a female. Posting too much, I don't think your comment is that great. Let's not do that because I don't think it's good, right? If you learn about it, um, try to correct yourself before I correct you, all right? Because <laughs> that's not good. Oh, and by the way, um in thai it's very easy for you to try to get into other people's private life but in america don't do that because it's considered rude and i'm not sure if you're experiencing the same thing or not but many of the colleagues will not ask about your private life and don't even like make jokes of jokes about it they may ask something like okay are your families okay those kind of yes. things you need help but they don't ask you you know deeper inside like uh, what you do who you like how many friends you have uh, those kind of things so those are not considered something that's um good to speak with english uh with american people um so i try not to do that even though it's okay in thai um, but that's not true in other countries so try to try to stay away from doing that if they if they like feel comfortable with you enough they yes. start talk with about the family so only you, if you are close enough close you out. know each other well enough like i don't even know you who you are right if you're my friend for 10 years and then we know each other for 10 years yeah go ahead you, you can, you can ask me family yeah families private lives not a problem but i've never seen you before and you're private you know uh, from somewhere i i don't think it's appropriate to to say things like that uh and I know like many of people will say, you know, you're a public figure. You're supposed to be able to handle all of these comments. Well, it's not true. Why should public figure be bullied or be harassed in many ways or be at, asked uh, inappropriate question? Should not be that way. I don't want to make that a norm because if it is, I will destroy that norm right now and in the future as well. So I'm, I'm not a very kind person in that regards. I take this seriously and I don't let it slide, as you all know me by now probably all righty <laughs> see I'm, I'm like a devil sometime you i have to yeah i i i was born 
I like more of the devil stuff, like a dark stuff as a kid. Like I always buy a figure of like the the monster, <laughs> not like the heroes. I, I buy the figure of like the bad guys, those kind of thing as a, as a kid. So I grew up that way. And I, re I still have that in me. But I think eventually you learn either way. If you learn from the good side or you learn from the bad side, it goes to the same place if you're good enough, you know? Because otherwise, how can I be here? Right? If I learn from the bad things, I can still be here and, and arrive at the same place. You know, everything has benefit on it. Yeah, everything has benefit on it. Depend on how you look. Yep, that's true. Well, let's talk a little bit more in how to take care of lung transplant patients. So, number one, they do have other problems as normal human beings do diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, anemia, and so on, and cancer, and so on. But what's different is that they are needing immune suppression and prevention of reactivation of certain diseases. So immune suppression, we need to do, we may have to make sure these balances between the three triple anti-rejection medications, okay? And even with this, sometimes it's too much, sometimes it's too little. So we have to constantly adjusting it. We have to do surveillance bronchoscopy and a biopsy of the lung to see if their lung reject or not. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what we do with our medication, even though it's perfect all the time, you can still reject your new lung. And if that does happen, then we treat it with big dose steroid, like one grams of uh, methylprednisolone, a big, huge dose, like three times. Can we push on the PO? It's going to be through the veins. It's okay. a drip. It's not a okay. push. Okay. But you have to be admitted for it because okay. big dose of steroid can cause you to have a lot of problem, especially delirium. They can get crazy at times. You won't be able to sleep sometime. And some people will have a lot of sugar problem. Like their sugar goes yes. like 400, 500. So we need to make sure that we take care of that. And in fact, transplant medication makes people diabetic. Immune suppression can cause a lot of problems, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol problems, kidney disease. It's very, very common to see chronic kidney disease stage three within two, three years after transplant because of our medication. Oh. Our medication is doing it. Got it. And some people have tremor like this. Some people have hair loss because of our medication. Some people, their skin are thin and they are bruising all over the place because of the steroid they're taking. Steroids. So these medications are not safe. They cause a lot of troubles. And our job is to make sure that trouble is not too much for them. And sometimes we have to treat these uh, problems. So many of our patients will go home on insulin because right off the bat, their sugar are very, very high from the transplant medication. So they're going home on insulin. They're going home on antihypertensive medicine because of that, these are very common. And tacrolimus, or the main backbone of immune suppression, will also cause electrolyte problem, such as hyperkalemia. Their potassium is going to go high. Mm. Their magnesium is going to go to waste because they peed out a lot of magnesium. So our transplant patient is going to be on magnesium supplementations. This is when magnesium supplementation is always a must for you because you're going to waste a lot of them. I see. So you're going to be on this treatment and other treatment for the thing that your medication creates as a side effect. So these are things you need to know. And all of these immune suppression, suppress your immunes. Immune system are, are doing many things that's good for you, which is number one, they fight off infection. Number two, it fights off cancer. So if you're on immune suppression for a long time, your chance of having cancer go higher. The most common cancer we see in lung transplant or any other organ transplant is skin cancer. I see. If you are transplanted in Thailand, you have a chance of higher skin cancer because, well, there's the light sun. sun all the time. You go out and then your, your skin becomes cancerous and you have to treat it. I see. And the TB is important of that also? TB is very, very important. Luckily, we don't have a lot of TB in the United States. TB has to be treated completely before transplant because if you still have an active TB, 
then it can recur after lung transplant. It's like everywhere, and then patient can die. And TB, um, if you're from Thailand, you probably know by now that TB is not only involving the lungs. It can involve everywhere in your body system, the eyes, the brain, the oropharynx, the stomach, the small bowels, the bone, everywhere can have TB. So you have to treat it properly before you transplant the patient. Otherwise, maybe you suppress the immune system. TB will pop out in your stomach, right? Yes. And, uh, I, I and, read and, the yeah. case, something like TB go to the skin area. Yeah, Cross skin, node, lymph jaw, node, yeah. everything, and um, and therefore you need to treat them. Also, the medication we use to treat TB has a lot of interaction with our transplant medication. So therefore, you cannot use certain medication, such as rifampicin. You can never use that with tacolimus. Wow. So tacolimus has a lot of drug interactions and food interactions. So the food, we ask them to not take at all. It's grapefruit juice. I heard the story about the grapefruit, grapefruit juice. Pomelo. Pomelo. The same family. Same, so, same family. So you cannot eat this after transplant. If you like it, you have to forego it. Otherwise, you have problems with our medications. And if you're going to start yourself on supplements, something like we would like to know about that because sometimes it causes your level to go up and down and then you have problems. So Taclimus is a medication has a lot of interaction. It has side effects that we need to keep an eye out for and treat them. And this is why we need to know everything about it. And you know what? Taclimus is actually an antibiotics. It suppresses your immune, but it is an antibiotic to begin with. Taclimus is a macrolide antibiotics. It's a macrolide? It is a macrolide. Acetromycin group? Yes. Carytomycin group? Wow. So antibiotic this day, there are a lot of antibiotics, such as you can have antibiotics wow. that is macrolide antibiotic is something such as roxithromycin, erythromycin, clarithromycin, acetromycin, and tacrolimus is also a macrolide antibiotic. But wow. it's not killing organism. It's actually suppress your immune system. But it has side effect of the macrolides, which is they can prolong your QT control. And if they like, if they with the Silex or something like that, it reach more with yeah. the SSR, right? Yeah. Wow. So it causes a lot of interaction. So before you wow. start new medication on, on our patient, just check the interactions. Wow. If you really want to start them on, you need to talk to the transplant patient, uh, transplant um, hospital first before doing so. And then we have to monitor and tackle on this level very, very closely, make sure it doesn't go up or down too much. Wow. Yeah. So that's what we do. Let's see. I mean, I'm, I mean, the, you know, most uh, American patients with upper respiratory infection, they said, I need CPAC, I need CPAC, I need CPAC at all the time. Yeah, they always want that, but it doesn't do anything. Eventually, no. it will get to the point where they're kind of resistant. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. Well, people are asking where you are from, where where are you working right now? I working in Rome, Georgia, in the urgent care called Piedmont Urgent Care. It it managed by the third company called Will Street, but it's part of Piedmont Healthcare in Atlanta. So they have like a 60, 70. Yeah, so she you flew over yesterday or the day prior? Yes, yeah, the yesterday. So she flown from Georgia over to Boston. Um, typically today, I'm supposed to be on call on service, but luckily that my friends um, came back and he took the service over for me, which is good. The service the past two two weeks has been, I would say, the most busy service I've because ever had. Because of season and. The yeah, that and also many things like I typically have like maybe fifteen patients, but during. These past two weeks, I have up to 26 patients, oh my which is a lot. That's a um, lot for the inpatient. Yeah. But as you know me, I, I finish everything by 4 o'clock every day. It doesn't matter how busy I am. I found a way to do just that so that I can relax. Uh, and, then I, and then I go home and exercise. So exercise is a must for me. Like It doesn't matter what I'm doing. Just a little bit will be considered exercising. To me, 
Um, you don't have to do like half an hour and hour of cardio in your gym every single day because eventually you're gonna burn out. You're gonna not like doing it. Your thing is to make it your routine this so you can do it a little bit. When you get older, try to. Yeah, if you want to start it when you're older, it's even harder than when yes. you start young. Yeah, yes. So you have time to brush your teeth. You have time to take a shower. You have the time to go to the bathroom. Why don't you have a time to exercise? Because you don't think it's important enough to your life. Yes, and I I met one of the patient. He changed his life in his fifty. He said every time he used the restroom, he push up, and yeah. then later on became the routine. He lose weight. He out of diabetic medication on that good yeah. shape. He taught so, me something. So we have to do that, you know. And sometimes we learn and get uh, inspiration from, from our the patients. patients. Yes. I got yeah. that this gentleman been to Thailand. He said he been to Thailand. He been to China. He been mm -hmm. to. So that what he told me. Well, some people are asking for the book that I would recommend to a teenager. I, I'm not sure if I know what I should be recommend to the teenager. I read Harry Potter back then. Uh, it's a good, it's a good book for teenager, right? But uh, if you don't like that kind of books, maybe. Um, I know you know about all these like Lord of the Ring and those kind of things, but uh, Lord of the Ring, the English is a little bit more difficult, difficult to understand than, than Harry Potter. Harry Potter is very like, straightforward. It's easy to read. If you've never read anything before, Harry Potter is a good start. But you want to make it spicier than older, um, then Lord of the Ring is, is good for you. Is that deep, deep meaning? Yeah, there's a lot of difficult English in, in that books. Um, and also, if you know all these novels, then I would suggest you try reading some news, especially business news or politic news, because they're going to use the vocabulary that you never heard about before in your life. And sometimes I don't even understand what they're trying to say. Even now, I, I'm still having a hard time, especially the headline. Like, what are you trying to say? What does it mean? If it's not my field, though, if it's like business field, lawyers, those kind of feel it's kind of like uh, things that's quite specialized in their field and they have their own language. And sometimes, like a joke also, if you're not raised and born United States, oh, so yeah. it's kind of joke. You're like, huh? What? Explain. And then so the like, joke here. <laughs> and we were like, huh? What? The jokes here might not be amusing to many of you. Um, <laughs> you have to be here for quite some time for, for you to, to understand, understand what, what it means. Uh, yes. But I found like many of the Thai jokes makes people here laugh for some reason maybe thai jokes are universal like people understand it very easily but for american jokes sometimes i don't understand what they're trying to say and sometimes it's not even funny and then, even if you understand it and then yeah, let's explain and they say well it's not funny anymore if i have to explain to you that what yeah and sometimes it's, it's, it's related to their sports uh, yes and i don't watch their sport i don't no. watch i watch a little bit of american football uh, baseball I don't like, so I don't watch them a lot. I just watch basketball, soccer, those kind of things are fine with me. I watch I used to watch tennis a lot more. You only read textbooks? Oh no. no. That's no. too that's too much. You put no. all your time reading a textbook. You should read something fun. No, no. Like I don't I, I don't always read textbook. I just read something else. Like Harry Potter, I I, I think it's good, you know. Good start. But you can read anything that you go about. But you can just go to Kino Kuniya and just go to like the English literature um, and look at each of the books, which is the bestseller. Maybe they understand a little bit more. And the South, the South, the South have their own joke, and the North have their own joke too. It's more fun. Yeah, we'll we'll see. What's that? You like manga when I was a teenager? Manga is good. Manga is also a good start because it doesn't have a lot of words. You can actually read it, but the, the English version of manga is more expensive, though. A lot more expensive, I have to say, because I, I used to go to Kinokoniya when I was younger, and then um, there's an English version of Japanese manga. It's like three times the price or something. Wow. And they don't let you open it. That's the bad part of it. But some of the Kinokuniya will, will let you open. So what I did was I go there and take these 10 books, have them open all of them, and just read all of them, and just don't buy it. 
<laughs> um, but uh, well, anyway, that's that's my thing. Textbook for. I mean, there's a lot of textbook you like to read about, but in medicine, reading textbook, um, I would say is very challenging because sometimes it can get very boring. And you know, for instance, I, for Harrison's, I don't know if you uh, ever used it before. Is that big book? That that one. It oh, it has a lot medicine. of okay. It has a lot of um, knowledge in there. Some some of them are not not easy to read because the texts are small and there are a bunch of them in one page. And if you just learn about something new and your English is also not good, you don't understand a thing. When you read the entire page, you forget about the entire thing and it's not fun anymore. So then you stop reading it. So to me, it's, it's not good book to start reading. But if you like reading it, that's uh, that's actually okay. You know, um, some people say when you're young your dad used to buy you something from oxford and that's very good dictionary well the skill for dictionary these days i don't think is going to exist anymore because nobody is using dictionary anymore you can yeah. just google everything google, yeah. it's, it's a lot easier but in the old days you have to use dictionary and, and in fact there is a competition um, for how fast you find a word when i was a kid and i don't know like what's the use anymore these days i mean you can just ask Google, Google Siri. Siri, or whatever. So we can punch Sam current reading a book called Stolen Focus. I've never read, I've never heard about this one. This book's Let's by a journalist. See. He gathered information about focusing ability. He interviewed a lot of scientists and looked at research paper. Sounds very interesting enough. Um, though to me these day, um, I, I might just read about something fun. To me, this is so I like something fun, something inspiring. Um, if I read a novel, it has to be something that's not sad and not a lot of people die. Unlike like Korean drama, where you know, when you read about it, this person died, this person has cancer, this person has leukemia. You know, I'm sure like when you read about Korean drama, that's when you learn about the cancer word, like leukemia. Nobody has heard about that until you read it. They have audible too. Yeah, that's audible. That's, I think that's good. I mean, you can you can read Audible or listen to Audible things on online. It's pretty good. For a language dictionary to use during the exam in an international programs. Interesting. Well, maybe they, they don't let you take in your phone, so therefore there's no Google, so you have to use dictionary. Uh, that's, that's so good. You're naturally interested in anything you can master it with hard happiness and Fulfillment. Well, that's true. That's true. I well, Sandy to, is uh, one example be, of that. I want to be better at what I'm doing because, each day. Because as if you if you don't catch us when we when we first start the live, so she's from Thailand. She studies something else that has nothing to do with nursing or the career she's doing right now. She studied like plant pathology or something like that, which is basically more of botanical stuff, and has nothing to do with human body. So then she moved over to the United States. Would like to become a nurse so she goes to a nursing school for the first time in her life in english yes which i make good great <laughs> right see so anything is possible like you you can actually do all those stuff and that's pretty good and then actually if uh, actually our medical classmates we don't compete each other who gonna be the best who gonna make the high school mm -hmm. we help each other to pass the class I think that's true for most of the school in the United States, not some, unlike Harvard. Harvard's I don't know like, about Harvard. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Harvard's crazy, just like Thailand. Really? I, yeah, I can know that because many people who uh, attend Harvard, they are very competitive. They have to be very good to begin with. And one thing is they're, they're unlike Thai people sometimes. So the competitiveness in, in Thai school are totally the next level. I know because I experienced it before. So what is it when, when you're in Thai high school where we ex, we are like fighting off each other? Like you try to hide some knowledge from your friend. Yes. You don't tell them. If you know about this, you don't tell them. You don't help them at all. 
but you may say out loud in general, like, oh, if I, I can help teach you on this subject, but this particular thing, I'm not going to tell you. That's going to be my secret for the exam. That's Thai. But United States, yeah, I want to be better than you. I'm going to study hard. I'm going to read hard. But when I when it comes to sharing information, I share everything. I don't keep things with me. So that's, that's how different the competitiveness uh, in Thailand and the United States are different from each other. So many of the Harvard students, when they, when they uh, work with me, they're obviously very smart. And they learn a lot quicker when compared to other people. And uh, not only that, they learn a lot quicker, they are well prepared. So when they come over to my service, they actually read about the patients. They try to make sense of each one. They go read and research on themselves, trying to solve the problem. And then when we have time to sit down together, they ask me, you know, can you go over this subject with me? Here is what I understand. This is what I've read. Let me tell you what I know. And then if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. That's how prepared the Harvard student is. Unlike other people in Thailand, I mean, you come over to the class, expect the teacher to teach everything, right? What is not in your exam um, may be something your teacher is talking about, but something that is in the exam and teacher has never mentioned about that, you get crazy about it. Like, oh, why can you have this when you're never taught us before? Well, that's actually how real life work, right? Yes, in the medicine. Right. I, I mean, everything in, in medicine or, or not medicine, sometimes we, we study something, but when we are in the real world, those questions or problems we have to face are not something we ever dealt, dealt with during, during our school. So it's your job to find out how to treat it or how to understand things, right? So I, I don't blame if the teacher is not teaching something and it's up there in the exam. It's your job to to try to do that. And, it, and the teacher is supposed to be the one who try to inspire the student to do that. Um, and, and that's the main thing. What's that? IMOI, I don't know what that's mean. Think difficultly when reading books. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't know, I, IMOI, think difficultly when reading books isn't that important if I have enough intention for it. When I read more difficult things, I spend like hours for just 45 pages annotating, and I find it a fun. Well, it's actually very good. And that's what I do anyway, because when I read each book, I try to make sense and really understand about it. It doesn't matter how slow I am, but I read things once, most of the time. Even during my study, I read once, and that's it. I don't read things like three, four, five times like many of my friends. Um, some people do that. I just typically do ones. Uh, maximum would be three for me. And then I really understand what it means. What I mean by understand is when I closed the book, I was able to recite that book. I was able to teach that subject I just read. If I can teach the entire subject I just read, I really understand it. If I cannot, go back and read it. I this see. is how I do things. I see. And sometime before I... Um, I teach a certain subject on my YouTube. Um, that subject I I can say very easily to people, but it's not to the point where I can present to the public yet. In order to present to the public, I need to understand a lot more nitty gritty things um, in order to do that. So I have to research a little bit more before I make the video. But when I research everything, things come from various source, right? I don't write things down. I just put it in my brain and then try to make things of everything I've read from various sources, and then I summarize once on, on each video. I just do a long cut and no cutting between. And that's how I learn things, how I really know, like I master the subject. If you make a video and have to cut like here and there, like, oh, every one or two minutes, oh, let's do a jump cut because I forgot to tell you about this thing. I forgot to mention this thing. I don't know what this means well, then you don't really understand a subject, right? That's the thing. Okay, so get a little bit more of transplant. Our medication causes a lot of trouble, as you can understand. Um, and therefore, you need to watch for that. The next thing we need to know is in our body, there are certain diseases that will recur, especially infection disease. So what we do is we call it um, prophylaxis. 
We prophylax for something that could reactivate in our body, and then we prevent something called opportunistic infection. Mm -hmm. So what actually is a reactivation? Reactivation is some disease, especially the viruses that live in your body, and wait until your immune status is low enough and it will come back and cause trouble. Those are usually herpes virus. Shingo is part of it too? Shingo is part of herpes virus. Okay, okay. So herpes virus is, like many people in Thailand call it worm. Worm is not a thing in the United States. It is not even a word. Some people thought it's English, it's not English, right? I'm not sure if you have experienced this before, but I've seen like many of the Thai students who came over here and say, I have worm here. What is worm? I don't really understand what it means. Like <laughs> it, it's not a worm. It's, it's called cold sore. Cold sore. It's, it's called cold sore. It's not worm. It's, worm is not English. So so that you are aware. And shingles is is different kind of herpes virus. So herpes virus, there are human herpes virus. There are eight type of it. There are human herpes virus one to eight, and each of them have their own names. Okay. So for instance, type one and type two are called her herpes simplex virus. virus. Herpes simplex virus type one and two. These are things that pop out and cause your cold sore or worm in Thai. And also the Genital. cold sore and genital area Genital. as well. And they, these just the only places they will arise. Now the her human herpes virus type three is the chicken pox oh. and the chinkles. It's called varicella zoster virus. So this is the third one. So varicella zoster virus, even if it cause chicken pox, it is the virus that cause chingles yeah. in the future. So chicken pox is something like everywhere in your body will have this vesicle pops up and it's very itchy and you have fever and you can have respiratory symptoms as well, like runny nose, cough, those kind of thing, right? But eventually, these virus they don't go away from your system ever once you're once you're done with your rashes it goes there and sits somewhere in your nervous system and then when your immune system is down like you don't sleep you do a lot of intermittent fasting too much um or you do absurd things and then it will come out as a jingles yes. in one of your nerves and it can be very painful and that's something what we want to do for prophylaxis to prevent from coming back as well and then there is CMV, which is yes. human circuit uh, virus type four. Is it that mono? Is it important? Mono is the fifth one. The fifth one. Okay. Yeah. So the fourth one is um, the cytomegalovirus or CMV. These are things that we hate the most in lung transplant because it causes the lungs to be rejected when it comes back or reactivates. And five is something called mono. Epstein Barr virus or Epstein Barr virus. So, Epstein Barr virus, uh, it used to be called a kissing disease. Yes. Because it comes from the United States where people kiss and they get that from saliva. And how it manifests is you have very, very big lymph node in your neck, can be very painful, difficult to swallow, you have fever, and uh, that's not a good thing. However, when you are done with that episode, it stays in your system forever. If you have it reactivates the next time and is good reactivation, it will become cancer. Yes. Called lymphoma. But after transplant, we call it post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder or PTLD. It's a little bit mouthful word, but uh, <laughs> we call it PTLD, but we don't like it. And six, seven, and eight, these are things that we found sometime. Six and seven usually cause some fever of unknown origin. They can be treated very easily. And eight is something that we hate because when it recurs, it can cause uh, three major different diseases. Number one is called multicentric Castleman disease. Uh, it's actually a lot of lymph node enlargement. We usually see this in HIV patients. We don't usually see them in lung transplant, but sometimes we do. Multi, uh, central Castleman disease, Kaposi sarcoma, mm. caused by this kind of virus. It can happen in the lung, it can happen in the skin or the mucosa space, uh, area, which is the red um, patch of thing that consists of a lot of blood vessels. So if you touch it, it might bleed. And we don't like this. 
And the third manifestation is primary effusion lymphoma. Not a lot of people know about this. Like I asked all of my students, none ever able to tell me like these three presentations of type eight herpes viruses. So now you know. Oh, now I know. Now you know, maybe you know a lot more than my student right now. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. We are, so, the, so these eight type of viruses are things that will reactivate and you need to be on prophylaxis. So for CMV, we can use valgancyclovir. For the herpes, we can use valtrex or valacyclovir. They're not the same thing. And the durations of prophylaxis depends on what you're dealing with. If it's CMV, you can be doing only uh, about six months to a year, depends on how risky you are. And then after you stop the prophylaxis, you still need to monitor them very closely, make sure they don't reactivate afterwards. For the herpes or zoster, Typically, we do six months of the acyclovir or valacyclovir. However, my tips to you is that before transplant, you ask them how many cold sore episodes do you have in a year. If you have a lot of cold sore episodes, maybe you need a lifelong prophylaxis. And the reason for that is because even before transplant, even before you're exposed to the immune suppression, you used to have a lot of breakout from cold sore. Now, with transplant, you have immune suppression on board you're gonna break out a lot more. So if I stop your prophylaxis, it's a guarantee you're gonna have bad cold sore coming back at you. Mm -hmm. So when I see patients who are like having a lot of breakouts from, from uh, before transplant, I said, okay, you might have to be on this forever. So those are reactivations, preventions. The next thing is opportunistic infection. Typically is the PJP things. Pneumocystis gyrovici pneumonia which is one kind of fungus, uh, it is a yeast, uh, it's everywhere in the air and you inhale it uh, when your immune system is suppressed, you can have severe um, lung problems. So you prevent it with, with a Bactrim. Mm. Mm. The Bactrim, there's Atovacone, there's Dapsone, inhale Patamidine, but the best one is gonna always be Bactrim. But if allergy to sulfur drug? we can do desensitization to it. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you have bad reaction, we can desensitize you to Bactrim. It's not a problem. We can do it in the ICU. Wow. Yeah. That's the first time I heard. Yeah, so if you're a lot of, have issue with the antibiotic um, allergies, if you really need to use that antibiotics, we can do desensitization in the ICU, meaning we can use a very, very tiny dose of that antibiotic and then monitor very closely and then start going up on a dose until you're able to tolerate full dose and keep you on that dose until you're completing your treatment. Wow. Well, I think you're literally lecturing. Yes, that's what I'm supposed to be doing anyway. <laughs> but it's just the fact that I today I don't have to be on service because otherwise I'll be doing this lecture off the life, just in the real life, but not like this. But well, since I'm not having to be on service, it's just like, why don't I just do this here? Might be beneficial to you all as well. Herpangina and herpes, how would you distinguish them apart? I would say it's gonna be very, very difficult to distinguish them apart because herpangina usually is in the back of your mouth. Yeah. That's the main feature of it. Like it caused by Coxsackie virus. Yeah. I I look into that one time between like a hand mouth for disease and herpes. So the herpangina sometimes can be caused by Hoxsackie virus and sometimes it's herpes virus uh, type six and seven. It can cause okay. herpangina in the okay. back in the back as well. It usually is a little bit larger than herpes um, simplex virus. Herpes simplex virus tends to also cover other places in your mouth. If it does go in your mouth, like your your buccal mucosa your palate and, and everywhere, but her pangina is usually in the back. Is, if it's only one side also, I thought I look at, I look at the case study, like a herpes, it's on the, like a chinger one also, it stay one side too, one, even in the palate. Yeah, um, sometimes you can use that, sometimes you cannot, because herpes simplex, Herpes simplex type one, type two, and varicella zoster, they live in your ganglion. Ganglion. When you live in your ganglion, when they come out, they're gonna come into the according nerve. So the nerve 
will be coming from the center, coming out one side, and the other one coming out the other side. So if this one coming out, it's going to be involving this nerve only, not the other one. So usually it's on one side if it's herpes. But it's not always the case because herpes, when it's on the skin, it can move over to the oh. other side. Same thing when it's inside. So we cannot always use this to tell them apart from her vagina and the real herpes okay. simplex. Okay. But if you really want to prove it, you need to scrape it, scrape it. and do a Zang smear or sometimes you are PCR. Like the old day we do Zang smear, right? You look into the uh, multinucleated giant cells. If um, they have that reaction, then this is herpes. But these days we don't do Zang smear anymore. We just do PCR is a lot easier. Like right. PCR is it's it's like swap and send yeah, out. Something like that. But if you cannot distinguish them apart, what I would suggest you do is to treat them as if they were to have herpes because they're treatable very easily. You can use a cyclovir, right? And then if you were to have her vagina and you end up having this medicine on board, it doesn't do anything, but it's no, it's, it does no harm as well. So you can actually use it. So uh, Sangden or Sandy, she is an actually a nurse practitioner in Georgia, in Atlanta, uh, in Rome, close to Atlanta. I don't, I don't think many people would know Rome. No, they know Rome in Italy. Italy. It's, it's not United States, but we do have Rome, even though we don't have a Colosseum. No, uh, well, there's such things in, in United States as well as Rome. Um, it's a lot of things. How you prevent infection? Well, one thing I would like to talk about is like when I when I explain how people get um, resistant organism infection while they're in the hospital. But why don't we get it as a providers? Well, number one, we are different than our patients because the patients got to admit it because they are sick. Right. Right. When they are sick their immune system are not normal anymore. They're weaker. So therefore they are prone to having infection while we are not. I mean, we are not sick going into the hospital. If we're sick, we're not supposed to go to the hospital. That's the policy. So we are, when we are not sick, our immune system are a lot better than those who are sick in the hospital, right? Yes. Even if we are exposed to the same thing. And we do take precautions. How do we take precautions? Hand we, we wash hands. We wear masks and sometimes we wear a gown, gown. something like that. We, we do everything. Goggle. Yeah, and goggle sometimes. Now, the thing is, when you as a family go to visit them, you may not be doing any of these. No. You may not wash your hands. You may not do anything. So therefore, you get sick very easily, right? You may get something in your yes. mouth and yes. you don't know about it. Good hand washing. And there are people who ask me, like, is alcohol hand rub enough? No. I would say no. no. So when do you use alcohol and when do you use a regular soap and water? I would suggest if you come back home from somewhere, just use like regular soap and water. That's very straightforward. It's very easy to do and just it's a good habit to do anyway. Um, but if you're if you're in the hospital or somewhere else, how would you know which one to use? The first thing is if your hands are dirty, just use yes. soap and water and never use alcohol. It doesn't alcohol work. Alcohol become you can tell the alcohol is start become thick on your hand. It's, it's, yeah, it, it, it doesn't work. It becomes slimy on your yes, hands. Yes, it's slimy. And uh, I'm like, oh no, I wash my hand. So just wash your hand. But uh, there are three organisms in which alcohol cannot kill. Actually, more than that. But if you get these three organisms while in the hospital, we will have a sign in from the room that said, after you leave the room, you need to wash your hand with soap and water and not just alcohol that we provided you. I'm not sure if any of you knows like what those three organisms are. Maybe no. you, you don't know? No, go ahead. You don't know? C. Diff? <laughs> well, C. Diff is one of them. Uh, C stand for Clostridioides difficile, so it's changed the name from Clostridium. So now it's Clostridioides difficile. 
So this is organism that's called gram-positive organism. This is a rod thing, and it can produce spore, and the spore cannot be killed by alcohol. Mm -hmm. So you need to wash that, do a mechanical wash and get it out of your hand. So this is one. Second thing is something called norovirus, which Normal can cause virus. very bad diarrhea. So if you were to have someone who have diarrhea and you live in the same household and you don't wash your hand, maybe if that's the, this norovirus, you have bad diarrhea uh, as a consequence of not washing your hands because these organisms are too small for you to see. So let's say you might touch your something and look at your hand, oh, it looks clean. It's nothing on your hand. There may be millions of them on your hands already by now. So you need to wash your hands. And the third one, I'm not sure if you heard about this, is how it's called Candida auris. Oh, yes. So it's not a regular Candida. So typical Candida, we call it Candida albican, albican. Candida okay. paracellosis, dubliniensis, um, a bunch of things, crucia and so on, except for this Candida auris. Candida auris is very interesting Candida is because it's kind of resistant to all of the azo that, that you have. You can only use IV therapy for it, like mycofungin, caspofungin, anidolafungin, echinocanthins. These are things you can use to treat Candida auris. And it used to be a um, endemic in, I think, New York ICU and it infect many patients in the ICU. So it's very, very bad nosocomial infection in, in that area. And it's kind of reportable disease. You need to kill them. Um, and when, when you have this, it's very hard to treat because you need to be on IV therapy, unlike other candidates where you can take pills to go home. You cannot take pills to go home. I see. You have to take this. And if you have deep-seated infection, let's say in your bloodstream or some big organs like lungs, now you're stuck with this IV therapy for three months, sometimes six months. So you go home, you have to come back every single day to do that. But uh, in in the United States, what we have is we have the, what we call PIC line or, or peripheral inserted central catheter, which unfortunately I don't see that in Thailand at all. Maybe they, they do have it, but very rarely that they ever use it. But here's a very common thing. You have a line that goes here into your big veins above your heart, and then you can infuse antibiotic that way at home by yourself, not by the nurse. So, so that's something that people are doing here. Uh, but if you have this candida or its infection, uh, you're dealing with this anti-fungal uh, anti every single day at home. Do it yourself. So these are three things that you need to wash your hand for. The candida oris, the C. diff, neural virus. So very important to do that. Say... I wash my hands and the whole arms every time I come home. That's actually a lot. Um, why don't you just take a shower if that's the case? You know, <laughs> I think you should. You you need to wash the entire body and and your hair as well. Anyway, right? How's the weather at your house? Well, the weather here is. Uh, I think is around like zero degrees centigrade. I wear skirt still. Hmm? I wear skirt still. Walk around. Yeah, it's it's okay, but it's a lot colder than in Georgia, right? Oh, yeah. In Georgia, it's not it's not cold at all. No, no, not at all. So they're mentioning uh, there is news about oyster and diarrhea these days. Oh. You know what happens with those patients? So uncooked seafood. Those who have immune suppression, like lung transplant patients, should not eat uncooked seafood whatsoever no if, ands, or buts, because they can get infected very easily. Is it Vibro, Vibrio? The name? Vibrio. The Vibrio. You know the surname of it? I don't know. Vibrio something. Vibrio valnificus. So, uh, so you eat oyster, it's not clean. They have something called Vibrio valnificus and something uh, sometimes we can see Vibrio parahemolyticus as well as Aromanas hydrophila. The three different things that can cause you life. So wow. Vibrio valnificus is some classic organism that infects those who have cirrhosis or liver problems. And then it manifests as severe skin infection and chalk, as well as you have 
um, blood filled lamp in your skin. So your skin necrosis is filled with blood. That's very, very common for liberal vulnificus. You need to kill them like right away. Aromonas, the same thing. You can have chalk, skin infection. And since you don't know which one you're treating, you need to use big gun antibiotics until you have the culture back and then you can tailor your antibiotics towards whatever you're treating. So these vibrioles and aromanas, typically they're, they're good with um, cefepine, ceftazidine, those kind of things. Ceftriaxone, sometimes we can use it. Um, but these days we start seeing more of the resistant, resistant. organisms more and more these days. So there's been an issues. Alcohol spray, uh, I don't think it's going to be helpful that much because it evaporates very, very quickly. Now, may I ask you, how long do we have to leave the alcohol on the surface before it considered cleaning everything? 10 seconds, 5 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, do you know? Well, typically it has to be about 20 to 30 seconds. So alcohol spray... Five seconds is gone. So you're not even killing any organism. So you it know, doesn't make sense. When we do uh, IV administration, we have to rub the heart for 30 seconds. Yeah. 15 to 30 seconds. Pig line, we, I've been told 30 seconds. Pig line, you have to be very careful. You have yes, to make sure it's very clean. Yes. And then the, but the heart for the peripheral line, we have to do at least 15 seconds. Well, somebody knows about 30 seconds. That's pretty good. Three hours are probably too much. Your skin will be sloughing off by that time. <laughs> Some people know about vibro vulnificus. That's very good. What's the best moisturizer the hand gets so dry? I have no idea. You probably have to ask the dermatologist, right? I think the Aquaphor might be the best. I, don't know. I think it depends on what you like. Um, but everything's going to take care. Yeah. Avino is good also. Avino is good. Yeah, many people love Avino. It's a little bit expensive. Hmm. 30 seconds. Uh, you just need to spray alcohol into your hands. So for 30 seconds, probably, yeah, that's where you're going to waste a lot of alcohol. Why don't you just use a gel then, if that's the case? Because gels last longer on your skin and it's going to be more than 30 seconds anyway, rather than try to empty out your alcohol spray. You know, with the same amount, you can use the alcohol they have. Yeah. So those are, I think, more of the transplant slash something else that you have other thing you would like to know about things in there anyway. My, my friend actually want to share to you too. She, she likes, she said, yeah, she started the NP. She's Thai or she's? Thai. Well, we'll see because I have come back from Thailand and then after that I'll work for a little bit. Yes. And then I don't know if she can contact Miss Betty. Yeah, I, I typically work early in the morning if I'm on service. Um, I don't expect you to come at 5 o'clock in the morning, but you'll be here at 7 o'clock. Yes, sir. Tomorrow I come in. Yeah. So when I when I work on service, I see I start working around like 450 I'm at the hospital already, 4.50s, and I start looking up charts and stuff like that. And then if it's a lot of patient, I'll be done looking at charts at 7 o'clock. And even if I, I'm not finishing, I'm just going to go around at 7 o'clock, like chart. See all the patients, and then um, our patient consists of a regular post-transplant who got admitted to the medicine team, which is under our team and post-transplant surgical team, which is fresh transplant, and then the ICU or the medical ICU as well as surgical thoracic ICU, which is newly transplanted patients. So we have to round on many places in the hospital. And once we're done rounding, we formulate a plan, and then we start writing notes. So my note usually is done by like 11 or 12 at most. And the first day might be a little bit later than that, but that's normal anyway. In the afternoon, we typically have a um, procedure, like I do bronchoscopy with biopsy. So that's gonna be done sometime in the afternoon. And family meetings, as well as so we have a team meeting. So team meeting consists of the Zoom meeting like this, and I will be meeting with our transplant pharmacist, nutritionist, um, social worker, 
um, NPs, PAs on the teams. And then we talk about every patient that we just formulate a plan in the morning and catch up on what's going on with them. Now, what, what we order in the morning, it hasn't come back yet or what we want to do about it. Is there any progression of certain disease or not? Then we formulate another plan. We also go over something called tacrolimus level because tacrolimus, as you men I mentioned before, we have to monitor the level. And then based on the level, we adjust the medication, go up and down, depends. Um, and then after that is done, we wait until four o'clock. If that's nothing, I go home. And in the meantime, I have a lot of time to teach all the fellows and residents anyway. And their job, as well as my shadow words, if they come, is to write all the questions you have on rounds. And you need to find a question. That's your job, to find a question to ask me. If you finish rounding and you don't have question, that's your problem. You have to fix that. You have to come up with question. If you don't have question, you don't understand a thing, right? Yeah. If you have too much question, too many questions, you don't understand a thing either. So you have to have just right, and the question is supposed to be good. So that's the first test I typically give patients or you you go and you know find a good question to ask if it's a question that you can figure out yourself like yeah i can read it on google or somewhere that's not a good question the question that is good is something you cannot find online and it needs expertise or understanding before you can answer that question for instance what is tacrolimus this is not a good question it's easy you can actually look it up online what are side effects of it it's not a good question Right. How about what do we do if the patient received rifampicin and now your your tacrolimus level go down to zero? How do we deal with that? This is a good question because you can never find this anywhere. True. Right. Because it's not in the regular practice. Right. It's not in a regular practice. You cannot find it on the book or something. So so that is something very good for you to come up with the the questions, and then. I will typically assign one of the topics for you to read every single day. Doesn't matter what that topic is. And then you're supposed to read it in the morning, tomorrow, after round, you talk about that topic as if you were to teach someone else to make them understand. That's how I test you. Like you go read about maybe acute rejection and then tomorrow, just tell me you know about your acute rejection as if I were a um, maybe 10 years old boy sitting here and listening to the professor. If you can tell me that, then I understand that, okay, that makes sense. But if you were trying to say something, you forget about thing, you don't know what this means, maybe you have not done your homework that well enough because these things you can read. It's a big topic, but you can read. You can really make sure you understand things, right? And it's everywhere. It's not just like a, a one-liner things or three-liners where you can read and then be done with it, but it needs some more in depth, that's why I have people go home and read about it because you cannot answer me within like one minute of reading it. It's not possible, okay? And that's how I, I operate things when I'm on call. Awesome. Maybe a lot different than other people because they, if they're get if they're busy, they don't teach. And most of them, my friend, they don't teach as well because they, unfortunately, they're too busy in their time. They have the family to take care of this so they don't come in early as I do. Uh, and so on they have meetings and and therefore second uh important thing will become their teaching so the teaching will not be the primary thing they have to take care of all this clinical work first and then think about teaching later on which most of the time they cannot teach right once they're done with that um they still have work to do they go home like late sometime like seven o'clock nine o'clock even ten o'clock my my friends has been here until like 11 o'clock one time what are you doing here at 11 o'clock? I was seeing that he's just start attesting the note that was written by the fellows and other people. Oh, Why are you doing this time? You should be sleeping or doing something else rather than work, right? So that's uh, what I call like life work balance. I don't wanna carry work to my home. Oh. Just get it done and then be just do something else. Then what the topic of urgent care, we open eight to eight and then expect we need to close the short within for the eight hour and be done. Yeah. Like I typically don't do anything beyond my time. Like if I have a schedule at four, four is my time that I'm going home. Unless there is emergency. 
If it's not an emergency, doesn't matter what it is, I'm not going to stay. Whoever take over, just take over. Because otherwise you'll see like in Thailand, oh, I still have a lot of patients to take care of. There's still a lot more, but uh, I cannot do all of them within one hour. They keep coming, coming, coming. Then you don't have work-life balance. You have to know where you draw a line. Like, okay, four o'clock, I'm off. The next person take care of it. In the morning, I'll come back and take care of whoever's left behind. Because this way is not because you're going to try to give all this burden that you have to your friends. But in the morning when you take over, you take the burden from your friends to you anyway. So if this is the case that it is fair for you to leave at four o'clock, leave everything else to your friend, come back in the morning, take all the burden your friend has left, yours. And then your friend can go back and take some sleep. So you need to draw a line very clearly. I, I mentioned this many times and many of the people will think as, you know, you should... You should not be doing that. You should be more responsible for things. You should devote yourself to doing things. I, I don't think that's that's good anymore. Because you have your own life, your your family and stuff like that. You know, you need to do that. Otherwise, when you are getting to higher up rank, you start to have problems then because you're older, you're slower, you have family to take care of, and you start to exploit your subordinates. You start to tell them, okay, you need to do that and that I'm going home. That's not fair, right? So then you enter the realm of fairness and um, ineffective work management, and then your life, work, and balance will never be in existence. Right. Okay. Let's see what they say. Oh, they're still not over how to how to take care of your uh, sanitation of your hands. Uh Okay, they're using a dishwasher for everything. Well, it's up to you. I mean, dishwasher is um, definitely can clean out grease easier than a regular soap and shampoo. If you want to use it on your head, nah, be my guest. I'm not <laughs> going to do that though. But but your head might be a little dry after you use it because. The hair, you're not supposed to get all the grease out. No. You have to leave something in, otherwise you have dry hair. Dry hair. Right, and especially your scalp. If you don't have enough oil on your scalp, and then it's get itchy, and then you have dandruff. And what are all these things about? Well, actually, today I'm not answering many of your questions. I just like scroll through and see if there's anything interesting so I can come up and talk about well tomorrow we may have another live but it also depends on when I'm doing it because uh, I will actually uh, my meeting will, up, will end around like nine plus minus depends and then afterwards we can actually do some talk like this but uh, we can think about like the topic what we're gonna talk about how do you pick up the accent just speak that's how you learn i mean you can actually do watch any kind of english or american show and pause every time you um have listened to one sentence and try to say that sentences out loud multiple times and you get your accent close to the original that's how you learn it keep speaking yeah keep speaking if i touch a tuberculosis page is patient, not patience, because patience mean you are going to do something over and over again, and then you have more willpower to do it. That's called patience. So patience start with is spelled with a T, not C E. What can I do to not be infected? So tuberculosis is not uh, contracted by touch. So you touch, you don't get tuberculosis. It's only when you inhale. The then drop, you get the droplet. And then you airborne. then uh, then you get the tuberculosis. So it's airborne isolation that you need to do. If you are within the same household as those who are diagnosed with tuberculosis, the chance is you probably have it in your system already. So you have to go check. If you do have it in your system um, and you're not manifesting it, maybe you have something called latent TB, which I actually talked about that already and how you get rid of it. You just take some medicine and they just take care of it. 
now, if you don't have it and you have to live with these patients, now the patient has to wear a mask. A regular mask would do. And whenever they cough, I would suggest in Thailand, you get a bucket of water, all right? And then when they have phlegm, just have them spit in that water. So this way it prevents the evaporation of the phlegm to become airborne because that's how you get tuberculosis. So if you cough into the water, then it cannot evaporate, right? This and you want, and you don't get a problem. This makes sense. Yeah, and they don't teach you this in the United States because what you do with the TB patients? Isolate. You isolate them, you admit them to the hospital. In Thailand, no, you go home. Wow. And then you spread everything around. So you better know like how to take care of it. Like bucket of water is your friend. A regular mask, which everyone should have right now because a lot of dust in Thailand, a lot of infections. So you need to be, you, you have to be good for a mask. What does NP stand for? Nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioner. Oh, well, people are asking, uh, answering that or not. It is not physical contagious. Yes, correct. The thing that's physically contagious, uh, there are a lot of things, such as like, you have shingles, you touch it, or um, chicken pox, these are contagious. You have herpes, it can be contagious as well. And when you touch it, it comes to your hands and you get like infections. So the dentist can get it if you don't wear um, gloves or something like that. You're not taking care of yourself that well, then you get it. Um, battery for your phone is only 15%. You can actually charge it, right? It's easy to do. You have one-sided headache. You need to explain a little bit more than that. Like, what's the quality of your headache? Uh, what does it feel like? How long has it been there? What triggers it? Any other symptoms? How often you get it? Has, has you ever have this kind of problem before? Those kind of things before we can make um, the judgment of what that's all about, right? So when you ask question, like many of these people, when they ask question, they just come up with, oh, I have belly pain. Well, how can I know what the belly pain is all about? You don't explain to me in detail. Just like when you, when you drive a car, oh, my car broke. What do you mean your car broke? Is it your tire came off, your tires puncture, your engine doesn't work? What's no the battery. symptoms? Uh, what is it? You cannot start the car, right? We need a little bit more details before we can we can say what's going on with you. TB shouldn't be life-threatening disease anymore. Uh, I don't think so. TB can still be life-threatening. Depends on who you are. Uh, depends on who you are and depends on when you discover it. And if you discover it when you have disseminated TB, that can be deadly. Some people's lungs are destroyed already when we see them. So even if we can cure the TB in their lung, well, their lungs do very, very bad. It's not and, damage. And then you will not survive. Your lungs are already gone, right? So it can still be deadly if you, if you don't take care of it soon enough. And TB medication, I have to beg, and all of you, if you take it, just finish the course. Do not skip anything because then you're risking your life for more resistant TB. And what that means is you need to go on medication that has even more side effect than the regular one. The regular one have side effect to begin with, the liver problems, the skin problem, the other problems, but the second line, third line anti-TB medication that's a lot more side effect. You don't want to be on it if you could not. But if you need them and you're not taking them because of the side effect, then you're done because there's no cure after a second line or third line. So if you have TB, treat it, finish it. That's that's the main thing. Well, the rest of them are nothing much. Well, it's actually like almost midnight in Thailand. I, I think you, sh you should probably go and sleep and we can actually go and eat something after this. You know, any last words that you would like to ask us? Maybe we can, we can think about it. And, you know, if you want to do what kind of uh, topic you would like to hear about it tomorrow, because tomorrow we're going to be speaking in English again. Um, 
but we may do a little bit later than nine o'clock because it depends on when the conference end that we can talk about it. What will I eat for lunch? I have no idea yet, but we'll see. We'll take a look. There's Thai restaurant here. There's a American restaurant here as well. There are a lot of restaurants around us. Uh, we will just pick one. Well, I don't think like you ever, um, you're not sure what should we be talking about tomorrow. We'll think about something or maybe you just like do a leisure like this. So there's nothing formal about it, you know. You want to know about Rad 140? I made a video about all the SARMs. Just wait for it to be released. Okay. And I will tell you about not only Rad 140. I will tell you about Rad 140, Rad 150, Osterine MKs 2866, Andrine um, S4, YK11. You know all those names. S23. You know that, like Andro. LGD4033, I'll be talking about all of them in terms of dosage, side effect, what to expect, how long can you take it, PCTs, and before you take it, what you have to consider. Is it safe for you to take it without PCTs as some of the trainer try to sell that to you? You'll hear about it. Wow, I have no clue why it's bad. <laughs> Those are medication used for bodybuilding. Uh, and they're under like black or gray market. You can get it from anywhere, but the purity is not that great. And the thing is that it's not used in human being. So if you are going to use it. Um, you need to know the consequences and there are consequences. You just have to weigh risk and benefit. You think like getting big muscle is your goal. Doesn't matter what. Yeah. Use it. If you think your side effect is too much. Well, no. So it depends on on what you like to do. And there's no such thing as safe medication for bodybuilding. There's nothing that is safe. There's always something about it. Uh, it may be too much, maybe too little, uh, depends. So it might not be tomorrow, but we'll see. I already made a video, so we just have to wait for that video. I have not incorporated something that's not SARM, such as cardarine, clenbuterol, spenabolic, those things I have not incorporated in the video yet. Maybe I'll consider it the next time, especially those who want to do cutting. Well, speaking more of the body language, uh, bodybuilding language, but I, I, I think some, of you, some people who are interested in this will understand, but not all of them. Hmm. Things about eyesight. Well, I actually have a lot of eye videos. You can actually watch that. And I have a video of how to take care of your eyesight to make it um, last longer. Well, how can I work in the field without infection? Well, I already talked about that. You can uh, go back and um, I think the middle of life that we talk about that. Um, interesting immune suppressing drugs could be your top. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of medication that can cause immune suppression by different mechanism. Um, but it's hard to talk about all of them. There's no such thing as categorizing them because there are many mechanisms that these medications will do things to your body and they are used in different types of immune problems. So it's, it's not an easy topic. Even my fellow, they don't understand all of them. So um, I would say if you were to have certain questions, just ask that question so I can target to that question only because if you let me speak about immune suppression, uh, your head will explode very, very soon. It's a lot. Like to use coconut oil, just be my guest, do it. It's not a problem. Anyway, you have any last word for the audience before we come back tomorrow? No, <laughs> no. no. see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. I, maybe you can give some advice for those who would like to come over to the United States. I I actually have the uh, nurse friend that graduated from Thailand, and she has a lot of information about that. Yeah. But to start study from here, I have 
all information from start from zero. I can help with that all the way through. Start so maybe, maybe it's good. Like if any of you who would like to become a nurse in the United States, um, can contact Sandy. Yes, you can Maybe contact. She, I have a yeah. whole plan. Each college, but I look it all through. Yeah, so she knows how to do this because she has walked away before, uh, and she is the example of who is actually from Thailand, was not very successful in Thailand, come over to the United States, know nothing about the United States. English is very poor to begin with let alone studying nursing school yes. when the teacher is saying you're not going to succeed in this. What she proved her, her teacher wrong and you're now an NP in the United States and um, earning good money and have at least better work life balance than compared to Thailand. You're very, very good. And your English is good. By I'm, the way, I think I'm this is good. I am really loving it, loving every minute. Yeah. Even I have to work a lot. But one day I work seven days straight off one day, come back seven days. Yeah, because just because it, it's a, it's it's still fine. Yeah, it's a, I I would say it's a lot better than a nursing job in Thailand. Then what my friend said that I one time I said I want to know what the nursing in Thailand like, and she said no, Sandy no. I you will don't tell you no, Sandy no. Don't try even a year, <laughs> Sandy no. You not try that. I will tell you tomorrow if you ask me that question. I can go deeper down what the nursing life in Thailand likes well, because I, I have a lot of nurse friends in Thailand. She said no, Sandy, yeah. because she. But I have a nurse, a nurse friend that worked in Thailand before, and then how they become to work yeah. in United States. So, um, one guy asked you where you're from in Thailand. Lampang. Lampang, ka. Lampang, jiao. Lampang, na. Lampang, na, jiao. All right, my friend, we'll see you tomorrow again, maybe around the same time. Uh, and those who can, uh, who is not here on time, you can actually watch the video. We always uh, record it. All the live are actually on. And tomorrow we'll be speaking English again, a little time maybe, but mostly English. And we will try to answer a lot more of your question if you have interest. You can ask, uh, you can ask me in Thai or in English, but we encourage you to try English because that's where we are why we're here for to try to improve your English. You know, there's no judging. No, no, there's no judging. There's no right or wrong. If your sentence is wrong, I would just point it out. So this way you'll learn. If, if my sentence is wrong, you can tell me because many of my sentences are wrong, by the way, you know, you may and, not catch it. And in, in American people, they will correct you too. But yeah. No, just, they just want you to improve. Yep. All right. Take good care. We will see you again tomorrow. Thank Bye. you.